It's yeah. not the Americans who won the war for the no, allies. It's not. Yeah. the Soviet Union who came and destroyed Hitler. Like an American general said, they will fight the Ukrainian war till the last Ukrainian. Yes, right. Prime Minister Modi understands what matters to a country is economic power. Mm -hmm. Nehru destroyed the Indian economy and impoverished us. The following is a conversation with Mr. Mohandas Pai. Mr. Pai is a former CFO and board member with Infosys and he is also the co-founder of Akshay Patra. He is also a Padma Shri awardee. Please subscribe and enjoy the podcast. Mr. Mohandas Pai, welcome to the Abhijit Chawla podcast. Thank you so much for hosting me Thank in you. your wonderful office. Thank, Thank you, so you Abhijit. Good to talk to you. Absolutely, sir. So I would like to talk to you about a variety of topics, uh, mainly geopolitics, economics and other matters as well. So let's, let's begin with... Uh, what's happening in, in the major focus of the world, which is the war in Ukraine. What is your assessment of, of how things have progressed? It's been more than one year now. Who do you see is winning? Who do you see is losing? Is Putin losing the war? Is the West winning the war? Or is there something else? That's, uh, see, my okay. view is this is a part of the Cold War, which is supposedly ended a long time ago, mm -hmm. but which the military industrial complex in the United States is unable to accept. Mm -hmm. Russia that lump country after the Soviet Union was dissolved, mm. was trying to grow and come back. Yeltsin destroyed it yes. and created a vacuum. Yes. There's a famous debate in uh, the Oxford Student Union by a Russian comedian who was asked, why is there no democracy in Russia? Okay. And he said, you must remember that the serfs were there till 1917 in Russia, mm -hmm. it was a feudal country which never had a history of democracy. Mm -hmm. And then came Stalin, then came uh, Lenin and Stalin and the, and the Communist Party which uh, took over Russia and created the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And they were oppressive, they were totalitarian and they shut out dissent. <coughs> but what they did, they made sure that everybody has access to education, they got jobs, they didn't get much income. But they were comfortable. Mm. So there was certainty in society. Yes. And society decayed because much of the resources went to bolster up the Warsaw Pact against the West. Mm. The starting point for the Soviet Union was very low. Please remember that. And the Second World War essentially was won for the West because of the Soviet Union. Absolutely. The Soviet Union's lost 20 million men. Yes. It's yes. not the Americans who won the war for the no, Allies. It's not. Yeah. It was the Soviet Union who came and destroyed Hitler. Yes. Hitler's biggest mistake was. Operation Barbarossa, when he went against the Soviet Union, uh, overtaken by Hubris that he wants to get land for his people, yes. which is a big mistake. Yes. Because that kind of territory cannot be controlled by anybody. Mm -hmm. And Napoleon's grand army was destroyed by that adventure yes. many, uh, many, many years before that. Mm. Now, over a period of time, the West has not been able to understand what uh, Putin wanted. Mm -hmm. The Slavs are a very proud people. Yes. The Russians are still very proud people. They love their country, call it Mother Russia. They stand up for the country. They're very different from the West. Yes. And there is no culture of democracy. They want certainty. They want peace mm. and tranquility, which Putin has provided to them mm. and which Yeltsin had destroyed. Yes. And we must read history. Now, Putin is a major superpower because he has enough nuclear arms to destroy the world four times over. Yes. The economy may not be big, but he's got <laughs> nuclear arms. He has more nukes than the US. Yes. Yes. And he can use them. Yes. Irrationally, if he wants to. Mm. So, the West should have asked Putin to come into NATO and join together. He wanted to join. Yes. yes. And they refused yes. because they didn't understand that they did not want it. Because that would have, you know, guaranteed the safety and security of Europe. Mm. Because there are only two powers we can fight each other, United States and uh, Russia. Yes. And Russia joins NATO, which is to protect this. And NATO would have become an Asian power. Indeed. Because NATO would have had suzerainty right up to Vladivostok across Siberia. Yes. And if NATO had done that, they could have taken on China today. Indeed. Yes. So please remember, mm. the West forgot a very big strategic need that they had. Yes. Because of course, those at that point of time, China was nowhere in the reckoning, seen as a poor country, nobody could see forward, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, the Ukraine matter happened primarily because of the change in the leadership and the elections. The problem with Crimea, which Russia took over. And we must remember that after the war, Russia gifted Crimea to, uh, to Ukraine. Ukraine. Yes. And uh, the long ago, there was a battle called the Crimean War. The mm, Crimean yes. War Mid between century. Great Britain and Russia Yes. for the last cavalry-driven war 
after that came the industrial wars yes so it has its own history yes and russia held on and to the crimea despite invasion by others so the memory of that is very big and they're not, they're not going to gift it away mm. now ukraine applying for nato would mean that nuclear arms would come closer to the russian border <laughs> and uh, ukraine is very is next to russia yes now as it is many countries of the Soviet soviet union joined nato and there was a report which said that uh, at one point of time there's a commitment from the united states by um, you know president senior senior bush's uh, uh, you know secretary of state to say to uh, gorbachev that uh, they will not have this new country join nato and there will be buffer states for russia's security mm. yes and russia is very security conscious because it's been invaded by european powers so often yes the napoleonic invasion and hitler's invasion are fresh in the minds yes so i think it's important for the west to the west will not understand they're black and white so i think when uh, Putin asked Putin asked Ukraine not to go there and ask the West for commitment. They did not do it. They waited for him. Now they want to bleed uh, bleed Russia. Yes, just like Russia bled in Afghanistan, mm. and later when the Americans came there and they bled there with the Taliban and Russia supported with arms mm. and ammunition. So it's a great power game that is being played out. We don't know what will happen, but today if you look at it. Uh, Russia is bleeding. It's got sanctions, so it's hurting it very well. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of time before it hurts more. Mm -hmm. The Americans are also hurting, primarily because they're funding the Ukraine conflict. Yes. Like an American general said, they will fight the Ukrainian war till the last Ukrainian. Yes, right. <laughs> and uh, the Europeans are hurting mm -hmm. because now they have to increase the spending on defense to two percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. They have a huge social security commitment. The economy is not growing. Economy is aging. Yes. So reality has come. Mm. <laughs> they have to pay more for energy. They were getting deeply subsidized gas from Russia. Yes. It's gone. Yes. And uh, the chemical industry is gone. Much of the industry is gone and become less competitive. I mean, Germany, which is the biggest state there in in economic terms, is going into recession. It is. The German manufacturing is there. Yes. UK is uh, in deep trouble economically. France is in trouble. But the future of Europe is something that is clouded mm, yes. economically mm. and socially. Because their median age is about 47 years. The biggest mm. challenge for the planet is, in my view, aging. Mm. And we should discuss that. Right. So I think all this end result will be, this will be a war of attrition. I don't know when it's going to end. Hopefully reason will come to President Biden and Putin to sit across the table and come to a settlement. Uh, Xi has uh, become the supplier of goods and uh, many things to uh, Putin. Mm -hmm. And G has become stronger globally. Mm -hmm. He's facing sanctions on semiconductor area. Yes. Uh, but he has got 31% of global manufacturing. And even if you ship, it's going to take a long time. And the shifting is essentially happening in uh, Vietnam, Vietnam, which shares 1,200 kilometers with China. Yes. There's a Chinese entrepreneurs going across the border in Vietnam and doing it. <laughs> so I think this, this, is a, this is a big issue that is going to impact the world. And mm -hmm. we don't know when they will settle. Mm -hmm. But the world's geopolitical orders will change. China imports 85% of its oil from the Persian Gulf. Yes. And it passes to the Indo-Pacific. Yes. And that's why India becomes important. India is getting wooed by the West. Yes. India is a growing economic power. So the West requires us to be on their side. Mm -hmm. uh, least of all, not to be on anybody else's side. So you've got to be on their side. Mm -hmm. Even if we try to be independent and try to say that we're not going to fight anybody's army, etc. And in, for India too, China is a big enemy. It is. And yes. the Chinese are very clear that uh, they want to make sure that India does not come up. That's the whole intention because they want to be the big hegemon in Asia. Yes. Southeast Asia is formerly large part of it is called Indochina. Mm -hmm. It will now be called Indochina. China has hollowed out the economies of Southeast Asia mm -hmm. by importing a lot from them and using it to export outside. Okay. So they depend on uh, China for a lot of their trade. Uh, Japan <coughs> population is aging yes. and shrinking. Mm -hmm. Last year, 1.6 million Japanese side, 800,000 Japanese were born, mm -hmm. children were born. Okay. So the population of 124 million will shrink to 96 million by 2050. Okay. So they can't be a great power. Mm -hmm. Australia is a small country. Yes. So if you look at, uh, and, and South Korea too, has got a population problem, an aging problem. An aging problem. And there's North Korea up there, which is the Buddha. We was trying to, you know, go after them always. Mm. So I think the entire world is in a very unstable situation. It is, yes. And everybody is trying to create alliances to counter that. But the big thing will be very clear is mm. the West versus China in the future. 
the west versus china yeah right so the, the ukraine war has it really benefited china a lot or has it also put china under pressure so on the one hand we see that uh, the chinese are being rebuked for not uh, censoring the russians and and supplying them with various <laughs> things so is it something that uh, i think it's strengthened china mm -hmm. because geopolitically it has got uh, russia as a client state a client state now and most of the resources and oil and minerals which are there for russia is in the asian part of siberia mm -hmm. yes right and uh, china getting all those minerals and oil from sakali and other places which is in asia mm. will mean their oil security will go up yes their economic security will go up mm. and uh, china is 20 trillion dollars in gdp yes it could become bigger than the united states in 10 years mm -hmm. though it may not be richer in per capita terms right and china is spending 250 billion dollars on defense some say they're spending 700 billion dollars i see where the US spends $850 billion. Okay. And the Chinese are building up very sophisticated weapons. Mm. They're not there in nuclear area. Russia is there. Mm. So look at the partnership. That's a great But the key thing is Putin wants to be independent. He yes. doesn't want to be the younger brother of somebody else. Yes. That right. is a big challenge. Right. And that is where the West should talk to Putin and come to an agreement because mm. the West needs Putin more than Putin needs the West mm. to counter China in the future. Mm -hmm. If Putin were to be on the side of the West, it will be akin to what Kissinger and Nixon tried to Mao. get uh, China away from Russia. Right. The whole intention of that breakthrough was to get China away from Russia. Yes, right. And that was to break up the Soviet Union, right? Mm -hmm. So now they have to play the game. But it requires leaders of great maturity and understanding and history to do that. And today, I don't think they're there in the West. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the recent uh, visit of Prime Minister Modi to, Modi to the US? Do you see it as a success? Do you see any good deliverables? I think Prime Minister Modi's visit to the US was a great success mm -hmm. because geopolitically India is in an advantageous situation. Mm -hmm. And India under Prime Minister Modi has taken the lead in global affairs. Mm -hmm. COP21, India committed uh, to becoming a, uh, you know, a carbon free or carbon neutral country by 2070. Yes. Right? Yes. Till, till then, every COP, India used to play truant. Mm -hmm. India used to put up his hackles, not sign agreement, nitpick. But here he took the leadership. Mm -hmm. He jointly with uh, France started the World Solar Alliance, which is yes. tremendous. Yes. Correct? Yes. And he has uh, pursued his independent foreign policy for very long. Yes. He's, we got a good foreign policy with Putin. We got it with uh, America. <laughs> we bought American arms which is very good. Mm -hmm. So we're getting the latest technologies. Mm -hmm. We are not over dependent on Russia. And we explained our position to them. We are taking a strong position against anybody who is against our interest. Mm -hmm. And we are showing that we'll protect our people anywhere. We are a defensive power and not an offensive power. And he has taken steps to grow the economy very well and make the economy stronger because Prime Minister Modi understands what matters to a country is economic power. Mm -hmm. Soft power is okay, but you know, the real power has to be economic power, hard power, the yes. military, yes. and that's the way the world is. Mm -hmm. So his visit was an indication of how the US had changed the attitude to India. Mm. And he was welcomed and he played his part. He met all the entrepreneurs, everybody else. And the fact that so many Indians are risen to senior positions in American companies showed there's something special about India yes. in the United States. So I think that is a very good visit. And he has cultivated America for the last nine years. And all the benefits are now beginning to show. Mm. See, we should not make America an enemy just because of ideology. Yes. The UPA in his, and the UPA and the left made America an enemy, mm. <laughs> unnecessarily abusing America. Mm. It's like the old uh, uh, communist uh, Nara, you know, slogan. Mm -hmm. Yankee, go home, but take me with you. <laughs> Most of the CPIM are the lefty children are studying in American universities. How nice. Many of their relatives are running NGOs funded by American groups. Right. That's why they are opposed to the FCNRA be, being implied, being mm. applied correctly. Mm. So you see this, uh, you know, this cowardice and this, this hypocrisy happening there. Mm. And India unnecessarily, uh, unnecessarily was antagonistic to the US. Uh, so I think India has become very pragmatic, is looking after its interest. One of the big benefits of uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, foreign policy has been how the Middle East uh, treats us. Mm -hmm. The whole attitude Indeed. of the Middle East has changed towards India. Yes, right. The Middle East has become friendly. They have given national awards to Prime Minister Modi. We have agreements on investments. We have agreements on everywhere else. We are favored there. They don't see. They see as a long-term friend. Yes. 
and the Middle East has fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. Now, under Prince Salman, the American closely cultivated policy of domination of Saudi Arabia is gone. It's gone now. Prince Salman and his generation are telling the Americans, we are equals, treat us as equals and you are not dominant, don't push us around, don't patronize us. Yes. And uh, Prince Salman recently has uh, uh, created, a, uh, created a line to Pres President Xi to China. Yes, right. And they invited China to be the interlocutor to deal with Iran. Iran, yes. The Iranians have gone to China and the Prince Salman has allowed them to come to uh, come to, uh, you know, Riyadh. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also seeing Syria being readmitted in the Arab League. Yes, we are seeing that. And all that means Prince Salman is asserting himself and his power in the Middle East. And I think that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Because till then, the client state of the United States, and they could get what they want. Yes. They could get all the money, sell to them, whatever they want, etc. Now he's standing up and asserting independence. Now that's a very, very big thing. And India is in the right part of history. Mm. And Pakistan has ceased to exist in India's foreign policy. Totally. Yes. Totally. Yes. I mean, you know, we don't talk about Pakistan, even though the group of people in Delhi try to say, oh, we are neighbors. But you know, this, this is a terrorist nation. It because there are people who send terrorists to kill your own people and say, oh, we need peace. Mm. And you can't say, we must go, we are the big brother. They hate you. They write the history to hate you. Yes. The children are taught to hate India. Yes. They have contempt for Hindus. And they have contempt for India. They have an exaggerated sense of importance of their own. Yes. And they are a broken country. Totally, yes. And these people want to say this. You know, it's better we kill them at a distance and tell them, don't cross the border or they're going to get hit like he did. Yes. When he went to Balakot. Yes. And right. I think uh, the entire policy has been very good. Policy has been very good. And we have got the Middle East on our side. Mm. We got uh, Egypt on our side. Yes. Egypt policy has been very good. Mm. Egypt is a major Arab power. Yes. They're missing out uh, in growth today. Mm. And uh, North Africa, which is Islamic, is um, turning around. Mm -hmm. Pakistan still has um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the in the in Islamic, you know, all the Islamic countries, they mm -hmm. got an organization, IOC, I think. IOC. Yeah. OIC, OIC. OIC. Yes. Organization of Islamic countries. Yes. And there they still have a voice because of religion, mm -hmm. uh, but that voice is diminishing. Right. Because real politics will dominate anything else in the new world. Right. So, do you see the US as a nation in decline? Because they are now kind of withdrawing from the Middle East and we are seeing Mohammed bin Salman asserting himself. See, Abhijit, <coughs> if you read uh, Samuel Huntington's Class of Civilization, yes. there are many truths there. Mm -hmm. He makes the point that great powers and great countries get into economic overreach. Mm. And that economic overreach ultimately hurts them. America has got 25, 26 trillion dollars of debt. Yes. Interest rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. And America has been the world's policeman for long. Yes. It has tried to protect uh, Europe at its own cost. Mm -hmm. And it has the grand notion that it can control the entire world. Yes. By Pax Americana. Same like Pax Britannia. Yes. In the earlier century. Yes. And Great Britain lost everything because of economic overreach. They yes. could not run their empires. They could not. They fought wars, etc. Mm -hmm. But America is a 25 trillion dollar economy. It's a very big economy. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the challenge about America? The Americans build a narrative of American exceptionalism yes. to say they are the country which is very liberal, inclusive, great things, etc. And they build the myth based on an elite in the East Coast and the West Coast. Yes. The East Coast are the world elite, intellectual elite. The West Coast are the new tech elite mm. uh, who try to show that they want to be very caring and inclusive, etc. Yes. But they were deep fissures in the United States among people. Uh, poverty was growing. 45 million people are supposed to, in the US are supposed to live in poverty. And America is a broken society because all Americans have not done well. When America agreed to China sign the WTO, uh, they forgot that China could uh, destroy the whole industrial base which China has done. It sucked out. And the inflation being low in the last 30, uh, 20 years is because of Chinese goods coming in. Mm. Because the wages are being suppressed in China. Now that is gone. <coughs> so they forgot that this... Uh, you know, divide between the rich and the poor, between the coarse and others, and education has expanded. Yes. So you had the rise of President Trump. Because when President Trump came and said, make America great again, it resonated with people. Yes. And the people voted for that. Mm. And what President Trump did was to show the face of America to all Americans as a misogynistic, mm. racist, mm -hmm. broken, economically broken country, mm. broken not because of its economic power, which is very good but because of the division of everything else, 
with a government deep in debt. Right. And their foreign policy not working. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be the hegemon globally for too long unless you're very strong. Yes. So, it still has the world's best universities. Mm -hmm. That's not going to go away. Huh. It's like Britain having Oxford, Cambridge still, right? They still have it. They still have it, right? Yes. And they, an imperial college, they still have it. Apart yes. from that, the economic power, the UK doesn't have. Uh, whereas US has the economic power, they have the digital power in the valley. Mm -hmm. So, I think Trump showed everything and there was a reaction from the elites. Reaction from everybody to badmouth Trump, to put him up, etc. And Trump didn't play the game well. Yeah. I mean, he should have communicated better and won back, etc. But he didn't win. But Trump has shown America what America really is. Mm. A socially broken country, divide, deeply divided country. Now, it's up to the Americans yeah, of all dispositions to come together and work out a new idea of America. Mm -hmm. A new idea of America, uh, which talks about the values on which America was founded and what America should be for the future. Mm -hmm. Should America be the great society of Lyndon Johnson or should it be anything else? How do you bring in a better racial uh, peace in America? All the things are very important. There has to be a debate and the debate cannot be based on extremist, so-called progressive, uh, shut the rest, <laughs> my way, the highway yes. discussion that is there with the flavor of the week, with all this trans discussion, all kind of discussion. <laughs> by small group of people taking center stage. Mm. It has to be broad mass of people. Yes. And that, that's not happening. That's right. Uh, Biden uh, was unable to do anything. Biden was just there. You've seen the disastrous years of the Obama administration. Obama promised much but could not deliver. Mm -hmm. His uh, foreign policy was again a big disaster because the Middle East blew up. Syria and other countries blew up during the time. So you have an America today uh, which uh, has to mend itself and find its new way. And the new way cannot be as a hegemon but can be a partner. Mm -hmm. It can be a leader in the democratic countries around the world. But America has to accept democracy is different in different countries. Right. American democracy is very different from Indian democracy, very different from European democracy. And demo but you have to confer to the ideals and you can't have an abusive think tanks abusing India all the time, passing all kinds of silly reports because uh, Soros is funding them uh, for his own particular purposes. Mm -hmm. And you must understand most people are nationalists. Nationalist not to conquer others, which is European nationalism, but nationalist to protect their own interest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's extremely important. And uh, that is something that America has to find. So maybe the next president uh, will be able to do that. It requires a leader of exceptional ability to come together, uh, to get everybody together. Do you see President Biden standing for election again, 24? Yeah, President Biden will stand for election. He has already said that. He has? Yes. Okay. Do you think he's, is it, don't you think he's a little too old for that? Well, age is not a criteria in politics for the Americans or anywhere. Mm -hmm. You see in India too, we got an 82, 83 old person who is the head of a political party. Yes. Except Modi who has said above 75, please step aside, mm -hmm. which is very good. Yes. Because they are out of touch with the reality of a country where the average age is 27. Yes. The younger people are in dominant. Their mm -hmm. dreams are very different from the era you grew up in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, for example, our chief minister here is 75. Mm -hmm. And at a time when Karnataka GDP this year is expected to be uh, 25.6 lakh crores with a per capita 3.83 lakh crores. He is uh, pushing out his program to give 5 kgs of rice to 70% of the population. I see. Our per capita income in Karnataka 3 lakh 83 crore thousand crore this year published by his own government. Mm. But he wants to give 5 kg rice. What people want is higher education, skill development and more jobs that requires uh, industrial policy etc. Not 5 kg rice. Mm, right. I mean this what do you do with such people? Because they stopped thinking long ago and they don't understand what people need today. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, uh, we need a new leadership and I don't see it happening there. Uh, possibly I'm impressed by Vivek Ramaswamy, the candidate of the Republic. Okay. Because he's talking sense. Mm -hmm. He's talking about all the large issues. Mm -hmm. He's breaking the shibboleths and holy cows that uh, permeate America. Right. And today uh, the Supreme Court has <coughs> voted on Roe versus Wade. Which is very good in my opinion. Oh, they overturned it. Overturned it. Okay. Because Roe versus Wade was an incursion of the Supreme Court in the legislative powers of Congress. Hmm. And the principal reason they overturned it, said they, they said, is up to the state legislatures to bring in laws to manage this is not our job. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let the states bring in. Makes it's fine. sense. Yes. You pass the law based on what people want because that is democratic. Yes, right. You want to change something fundamentally, mm. you have to get the people's consent. Right. You can't be a court dictating. And then this affirmative action program, uh, they overturned it now. And they were right because one of the judges, Nalia, said uh, it should not last more than 25 years. It is against the constitution. We promise equality, 
uh, equality of opportunity irrespective of race mm -hmm. and affirmative action become more and more complex and uh, you know woolly headed things and uh, it is against uh, people mm -hmm. so i think uh, the supreme court has now become more conservative to stand for the original constitution is up to the legislature to come and do it so that requires new thinking yes and see the the us politics has been captured by a group of academics and extreme leftists yes, who right. are trying to push the narrative mm -hmm. i think it started uh, the time when the 90s early 90s when um, <coughs> the berlin wall fell yes francis fukuyama wrote the uh, the, the you know uh, the death of history right mm -hmm. or something like that right mm -hmm. he wrote the book the death of history and because he said liberal democracy is the only way forward communism has been destroyed and with liberal democracy being the only way forward uh, you have you know what is history history is gone because history always had opposing forces <laughs> now there's no opposing force and there's a grand narrative mm -hmm. the death of history and i think that's an important aspect because then they came from europe mm -hmm. because the french had this woke culture because if, and then they kicked them out they came to america yeah, for right. the last 15 years to last 30 40 years 30 years i think on 30 years now they indoctrinated the americans penetrated into colleges and others and they're shutting out others yes they are they're very totalitarian yes you shouldn't call them liberals you should call them fascists they're the opposite even, of in, even in india many of these people who say they're liberals should be called fascists totally yes because the true liberal is one who respects the right of everybody to their own opinion and will always protect the right to the opinion and not shut them out yes now they're shutting out people that's not liberalism that's not liberal that's not being a liberal yeah I mean, you hold your opinion, you argue on merit, and everybody has an opinion. Don't shut out any uh, schools of opinion, anything that comes. Mm -hmm. They shut them out in even in educational institutions in this country, in other places. Lesser now, but uh, it's happened in America. You've seen that happening, right? So I think America is in turmoil. Mm -hmm. America has to remake itself. Mm -hmm. The world is very different. It's got too much of debt. Two trillion dollars of debt for the children. Student, right. student loan debt. Yes. How will they ever pay back? How can any society call itself a great society and say we are exceptional people when they allow the young people who are entering their career, building their careers from college, go and enter life with $2 trillion of debt? It's incredible. Who's going to pay back the debt? Yes. The least you can do for young people is to give them a good education. Yes. And America grew up after the uh, World War in '45 to the GI Bill, which promised every American soldier and maybe every American is state-sponsored education. Mm -hmm. So the 50s and 60s, so the golden years of golden America, years. when Americans came up, and that is what made America today. Yes. Now that generation is fading away. Yes. The, their children may, may not have done well, and the new generation is coming. But the new generation is coming with two trillion dollars of debt. Yes. So and the concentration of wealth has been absurd. The state should at least provide free education or subsidy education to every young person. The biggest gift. Society can give. Even in India today, I would like the state governments and the central government to spend more on higher education. I agree. We solve the problem of school education by putting every child in school. Mm -hmm. We have not solved the quality problem of school education because the government system is broken. Yes. And that, that requires a different reform. Mm -hmm. But we are not producing more children. By the last 30 years, we are producing two and a half score children and it's not declining possibly in the near future mm -hmm. because <coughs> fertility rate has come down. But I think the key issue is uh, the society which puts this burden of debt on your young people, that's, that's how is it going to prosper? Nah, it's not sustainable. Yeah. yeah. W let's talk about birth rates. I think birth rates are falling the world over. Japan is an issue. In China, the total fertility rate during the pandemic fell to 1.1. That's a disaster. That's a catastrophe. In India also, we are now at 2.0, which is below replacement 2.1. So do you think this is a big issue going forward? for the Abhijit, I'm world? very happy you've chosen to speak on this topic. Let me say, in my opinion, the biggest challenge for humanity for the rest of the century is an aging society mm. and declining fertility. Mm. Let us look at data. Population is 8 billion people today. Yes. The UN, I think, had estimated 11 billion by 2100 or uh -huh. somebody else. Now, people are saying it will not go beyond 9.6 billion. Okay. Now, China is the largest country in the world with 1.45 billion people. Mm. <coughs> Last year, the Chinese population shrank by 0.43%. Okay. Last year, only 9.6 million babies were born. I see. Maybe one million, one and a half million died. Okay. So in future, you're going to see more people die in China and they become older uh, compared to this. And that's 1.45 billion people. Mm. And please remember, the Chinese workforce of 650 million peaked maybe six, seven years ago and is declining every year by a few million. Okay. Now, that is very big.
Mm. So when society is aging, you got to provide for more people. Yes. Then take Japan. Japan's population uh, last year, like I said, Japan had 1.6 million people die, 850,000 babies being born. And women don't want to have babies. Mm, yes. I read an article which said about 30% of Japanese under the age of 35 have not interacted with the opposite gender. Oh, wow. And the Japanese have not given the woman equal opportunity. Okay. And now with women getting education, coming in the workforce, they're asserting the independence. They don't want to get married. Mm. They don't want to have babies. Mm. If people, if women stop having babies, society is finished. Yes, it is. And we see that happening there. Mm. Korea's population is, is, will probably age and shrink. The fertility is 1.2, 1.3. It's is in massive decline. Korea is maybe 100 million people. Mm. So you've got 1.45 plus 125 is 1.56 plus, uh, you know, 100, 1 1.66 billion people. Mm. Now look at India. India's population of 1.42 <coughs> billion people has a fertility of 2.0. 2.0. But for a higher maternity and infant mortality, which is decline, of course, we need 2.3. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the 2.1 is based on some normal indices. Right. Uh, because, you know, uh, it is just 5%. So I think you must have. But our uh, uh, female maternal mortality are now at, it's come to 77 per 100,000 births. Okay. And uh, child mortality is 29 and so that's very good. Okay. But still we have a problem. Now, about 8% uh, of India's population today may be above the age of 60. Mm -hmm. That means about 130 million people, 13 crore people above the age of 60. Okay. And that is going to go up to 200 million by 2020. Okay. 20? 2020. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. 200 million by 2020, another eight, seven years. Okay. 2030. 2030, you mean? 2020. You can see that aging report. There's an old age report or something the government see. of India okay. has done uh -huh. by 2020 because uh -huh. it's aging rapidly. Okay. Now, you must understand that in the whole of the South, Karnataka, Kerala, uh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh, <coughs> and uh, uh, Telangana, mm -hmm. fertility is 1.6, 1.7. Oh, it's already Bengal is 1.6, 1.7. Punjab is 1.6, 1.7. Okay. The Sikhs have a fertility of 1.5 because the boys are running against uh, Canada for other reasons. Uh -huh. So, all across India, you see the fertility coming down. Bihar was uh, 3.2, now should be 2.9. UP is 2.6. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, Madhya Pradesh is around 2.7. And uh, we are seeing Rajasthan. We don't know the impact of COVID on fertility. I think it will reduce fertility all across India. Mm. So I think India's fertility will decline faster in future than we anticipate. Okay. All right. Because for the last 30 years, we've been producing 2.5 crore children. Mm. It's been static. Mm. So the percentage is coming down. And by 2030 or so, or maybe 2030, we could have more people above 60 than people below 15. I see. Mm. The pyramid gets inverted. Okay. And that will wear itself up. So, India doesn't have a population growth problem, but people are living longer. So, population may continue to grow. And I think by 2045, it will start declining. Mm. And by 2100, some people say our population could be 750 million or 800 million. I see. So, you add India to uh, India to this place, uh, to this uh, 1.6. So, it will be 3, 3 billion people out of 8 billion don't have a, a fertility, less fertility. Mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, 500 million people you can add. Mm -hmm. So, 3.5. Europe, about 450, 500 million people, fertility before replacement. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is 4, uh, four, uh, four uh, billion. Mm -hmm. South America, fertility in. Whole of America, fertility is below replacement rate. Right, yes. So, you add South America and this, maybe 750 million, 800 million, you can add it up. Okay. That's about 5 billion. The only place which is growing Africa. is Africa. Africa, yes. And Africa too is coming down with economic development. Mm -hmm. I think people see. Uh, Pakistan is growing. Bangladesh has come down okay. very much. Bangladesh, I think, will have an aging society soon. Mm. But the Bangladesh has done well. Pakistan is still going strong. It's a very macho country. That, that's what they think. <laughs> but I think the, in, in the Islamic world too, in the Middle East, I think fertility is down. I okay. do not see numbers. Okay. You know, and, um, so, fertility is essentially a condition of women's empowerment. Right. Mm -hmm. Data in India, which is a large country, shows clearly that wherever women get educated, they have lesser children. A postgraduate in India has one child. A, a class four, uh, you know, studied woman has four children. Mm. It's across communities. Right. 
the muslims are the same fertility as the scheduled caste community i see why both are economically poor mm -hmm. so fertility is a function of women's education and poverty i see it's not a function of religion like some people try to say mm -hmm. even though in islam many people may try to encourage more people okay. but in uh, muslim women get educated they control their families mm -hmm. because they want good things for the children mm. so the biggest thing that government of india can do is to give more scholarship for muslim children to give some data abijit Based on 1920 Aisha data, <coughs> SCST makes up 16.6 percent of population, 14.8 percent of students in college. Okay. ST is 8.8, mm -hmm. and uh, possibly 5.8 percent of students in college. Mm -hmm. Muslims are 15 percent today, are 15.1 mm -hmm. and 5.2 percent. Okay. They are the lowest. I see. They are the lowest. And OBC is 40 percent and 36 percent in college. Okay. And the rest is shrinking as a percentage because you know. Uh, they got a very high enrollment. Mm. So India's enrollment is 27.6, 27% in the age group of 18 to 23 go to college. We graduate nearly a crore of people every year. Okay. Uh, many of these Lutians Delhi don't understand this data, mm. and more women graduate than men. Okay. In America, 56% of graduates are women. I see. In uh, India, too, uh, more women are graduating now since uh, uh, than men. And more women will graduate more than men in future. More women are doing masters. More women are going for PhDs. And the traditional society it could be a way of escape from early marriage. I see. Mm -hmm. Because they want to be educated. Women have this aspiration to be economically strong, self-independent. You know how it is. Yes. And sir. I think is right. Mm -hmm. That's why the UCC is the most important reform for India at this point of time. Okay. The Muslim community has become the poorest community in India since independence because of minority appeasement. Okay. Bad leadership. This. Religious fundamentalism has hurt the Muslim women the most, and if you look at enrollment from the age twenty one, twenty two to twenty nine, thirty in nineteen twenty, Muslim girls enrollment has gone up by seven point nine percent, I think, and Muslim boys seven point five percent. But the aspiration education is very high, hmm. and that we must recognize. Right. And in 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 and in the uh, states where the appeasement is higher, Muslim participation in the in the education is the lowest. Kerala. I see. Kerala is very low. I see. Compared to the population, uh, Bengal is very low. Mm. These data are there. Okay. We wrote a report long ago called the Minority Report, uh -huh. uh, under which we gave all this. I'll send you the report if you want. Send okay. me an email. Okay. And I think it's important for people to understand this. Mm. And now there are 112 Muslim women who need equal rights. So the UCC should be termed as the Indian Women Right to Equality Act. Yes, right. Not a UCC because UCC get. Uh, you know the debate shifts to religion and all kind of mess, which you don't, which is which is irrelevant. Mm. UCC is about making sure that the promise of Article 14 and 19 given to us by our founding fathers in 1950 is put into action. Right, and I think it's a very important thing to do, and uh, we have to debate on that to say all Indian women have to get equal rights like men. Mm. Equal rights in what? In marriage, in inheritance of property. Property. In uh, divorce and settlement and maintenance, mm -hmm. and in um, uh, let us say custody of children and adoption, mm -hmm. uh, adoption, uh, that's it. What else is there? These are the four things. It's got nothing to do with stupid HUF and all that which people are trying to obfuscate. Okay. HUF is so small; it is totally irrelevant. Uh -huh. Many Muslim communities also have HUFs. Okay. The Kachi Menons and the Bora community or something have HUFs. They have HUFs. Yeah, because I they see. were all Hindus who were had that you have followed the same social thing. I see. The, the Kachi Boras and the Kojas, I think, have it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can read it up and find out. Okay. Uh, because they're very old thing and mm -hmm. it's, it's economic. It's got nothing to do with any religion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think it's important for people to understand that we need this. And today you'll be surprised, Abhijit. We have 1,020 National Family Health Survey five. 1,020 women per thousand men. Okay. And. Uh, We have at birth about 953 girl child to 1000 boys. I see. Which is pretty good. Uh -huh. It's gone up from 923. So Modi's policy of beti beti padao beti bachao bachao beti padao is working. Yes. And we see this improvement in Haryana and others places where the male child was there mm. driven by women who are educated. Right. So education of women the biggest thing and when women get educated fertility falls. Mm -hmm. Women empowerment rises which is a good thing for society. Mm. So biggest problem today is aging. Right. In Japan for instance Uh, today, 30 percent of people are above the age of 60, and they, it may go higher. So, yes. who is going to provide for them? Yes. And people live, men live up to 84, women up to 88. Uh, life is very long. Yes. 10 percent of the Japanese land has no claimants because the people are dead, mm. and the children don't want to claim because they have to pay debt duty. 
about 12-13% of MSMEs are, don't have an owner. I see. They're just dying off. I see. Nobody wants that. What do you do? It's a crisis of epic proportion that's happening. Uh -huh. The symbol of what happens when society ages, for which we have no solution. Mm. They're trying to incentivize women by doing many things, but women don't care. No, because sir. when you suppress women for so long, make them second grade citizens in any country, uh -huh. the moment they get women's freedom, they will assert themselves, which is right. Right. Now in India mm. too, the UCC in the form of an Indian Women Right to Equality Act is important because in 1952, we had the Hindu Code Bill. Mm -hmm. If religion prevents you from having uniformity in civil law, how did the Hindu Code Bill pass into law in 1956? 80% mm -hmm. population of Hindus have secular laws. Hinduism is a religion. Yes. So it can be termed anti-religion. How did it pass? The courts allowed it. In the Sabri Mala decision and in the Tribal Talak decision, Supreme Court has held very clearly <coughs> where there is a clash between Article 14 and 19. Mm -hmm. Right to equality and right to life. Mm. And Article 25 and 26, right to religion, 14 and 19 will prevail. Okay. So in the guise of religion, can you put outdated medieval concepts on women? Suppress them? Can you say, I will cover a woman fully and lock her up in the house, she cannot go outside. Can you do that? You can't do that. You can't do that. Because please remember Abhijit, all Indians should remember. This country was divided in the name of religion. Yes. The people who wanted Islam and Sharia left to go to Pakistan. The rest stayed back in this country. And our founding fathers gave us the constitution, which promises equality, liberty, fraternity, justice, and the dignity of the individual. Yes. And all of us are signatories to the constitution, which promises these rights. So this country is based on a constitution. The constitution has not been put into effect. And I think those people who want religion to prevail over all these principles are talking about the past. They're welcome to go anywhere they want. <laughs> yes. I mean, they left at one point of time because they wanted religion. Mm. The people who stayed back have to adhere to this. Yes, and why, I don't know why you should have this debate. Yes. And why people are having this debate. Mm. The constitution in the terms where we all came together. We the people came together. We all agreed. We all agreed. Mm. And there's the most liberal constitution in the world. Mm. It goes beyond any constitution in existence even today. Which constitution gives 50% reservation in government uh, uh, colleges and uh, educational institutions, 50% in government jobs? Nobody in the world. Which, which, which uh, constitution in the world gives special rights under Article 29 and 30 to linguistic and religious minorities in 1950? Nobody I, that I have seen. Mm. We pamper minority. I am a minority. Okay, you are. Yes. I am a linguistic minority. I am a Konkani. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. I'm a linguistic minority. Uh -huh. I should be treated equal like a religious minority, like a Muslim is treated. But I don't get any of the economic rights. They don't deny us all the benefits. They do discriminate. So it's pure appeasement politics that works. I see. And that has hurt Muslim women. Mm. Now, some Muslims say we don't want it, we want but that is not a matter of their concern. It is a promise made by our founding fathers to the whole country in 1950, which has to be affected. Mm. And we are protected only by the constitution, not by any family, any individual, any political party or anybody. Mm. It's the constitution that is supreme in this country or any religion as far as civil rights are concerned and the constitution that should prevail. And we should have a pure uh, technical issue there and say everybody will have equal rights. Now, Tibble Talak was abolished. What happened? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Yeah. I mean, they said there'll be riots, there'll be this. Nothing happened. Mm. You must give Muslims, some Muslims that we don't want it, that's fine. But that is not your prerogative. It is a promise made to us as a, as a country, as a republic. And the promise should be redeemed, that's all. Mm. So I think it's very important to do that. So if you look at all this fertility issue, mm. the world is aging. Yes. A larger part will be there. To me, that's the biggest threat for humanity. People say climate change is the biggest threat in this. Yes, climate change is a very big threat to humanity. Mm -hmm. But remember, the ozone layer is closing. Yes, right. I think you must do a podcast on that to say what has happened in ozone layer. Mm. And even in climate change, yes, temperatures have gone up on average. But the earth has been through these vicissitudes for a long period it of has. time. It has. It's something not happening in the last hundred years. Yes. Though in the last hundred years, the amount of carbonization has increased dramatically. Yes. And that's having a uh, impact. Yes. But I think people are taking remedial measures and has to wait through the system. And if you look at carbon uh, discharge 20 years ago and today, we have improved in the world. Hmm. Everywhere in the world has improved. Hmm. People may say it's not enough, but the world has improved. So I think that is a problem that we have to work to solve. Hmm. But how do you solve an aging when people don't exist? Yes, right. I mean, that is and and is and everybody is moving to more of liberalism and individual rights. Yes. And education. So I don't know. To me, that is the biggest thing. And that's why 
uh, when we worked with the Karnataka government to write the vision for a trillion dollars, we said we must put into place a social security measure for people above the age of 60. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that every Indian above the age of 60 has an old age pension or a regular income? We all have income and savings, but many people don't have. The state should provide. Right. We should provide them medical care. Mm -hmm. Because there's a huge gargantuan problem. Right. And we must give them free health insurance. Mm -hmm. <coughs> because health is the biggest cost for people above that age group. Mm -hmm. And we must give them security and houses, etc. So we have to work on a program right now. So by 2030, when the problem becomes bigger, we are prepared. Yes, but right. there's no focus there on today because people are engaged in fighting on other issues. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um, Fertility, I mean, um, aging is a big challenge. Right. So, fertility and aging is a big challenge. Climate change also is a problem. Climate change is a big challenge, but you know, we are facing it. There's a lot written on it. And it's an active item on the agenda. Yes. I think now we're going to have another COP or something, right? Mm. And countries have made commitments. Yes. And they'll keep the commitment. China is now possibly reaching its level of uh, alternate power another three, four years as against 2030. India is also oscillating very fast. Yes. So, we are focusing on renewable energy, on solar energy. Renewable energy, solar energy. See, but, but Abhiji, mm. the solution to the environmental problem is this. Mm. Gandhiji made a statement, the world has enough for everybody's need, not everybody's greed. Yes, right. If all individuals in the planet say, I will consume 20% less power than I did the previous month, it will work. Yes, right. How? I will walk instead of taking my car in a two-wheeler. Mm. I will turn off the lights in my house so that I don't waste power. Mm -hmm. I will use my heater less to heat water. Mm -hmm. My AC will be turned down or at a higher temperature. Mm -hmm. All my cooking appliances will be much more efficient. Right. You can cut down 20%. Yes. See, in Info says I started this move along with my team in 2009. Mm -hmm. At that point of time, our energy consumption was 297 units per person month. Okay. Today, we brought it down to about 137. Oh, that's a big change. Huge yes. Change. The number of employees are doubled, but energy is remain the same. And we, they become uh, carbon neutral and everything else for the last four years. It can be done. Okay. And it's a very simple way of doing it mm. without cost. You must cut down wastage, cut down uh, usage. Mm -hmm. Then you must replace old equipment, which are very inefficient. And then you must redesign your buildings, which are building and workspaces to reduce uh, energy consumption. Yes. We have a building in um, Hyderabad where one wing has conventional uh, air conditioning and other wing has air conditioning in the slab, water pipes in the slab. I see. And both of them are connected together in the dashboard to see energy consumption. Both are similar capacity. One consumes 135 units per person month, other 95. And daily you can see the total energy consumption. I see. And we are given the data Livermore and everybody else to do this. Mm. So it can be done. Right. And India has more Griha, Lee, Griha, five buildings and any country in the world which is equal to lead platinum. So we are changing. Mm. See, Abhijit, when you talk about anything, you must see the change at the margin, mm. not the change in the base. Right. Changing the base for a large country is very difficult. Mm. It takes time. Yes. But change at the margin where energy consumption in whatever you do is less shows a tremendous improvement in India and globally. Right. And today, as India grows, our energy consumption per unit of GDP growth is lesser than it was 20 years ago. Mm. Indeed. Yeah. Right. There's mm. a lot of things that we have to be proud of which we have done. But we've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go. Yes. And the biggest issue for, you know, uh, uh, decarbonized globally is money. If you want solar power, you need money. Yes. Who's funding you? Indeed. The West is saying, yeah, 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 and all that. Just the other day, I saw a very shameful exercise by Pierre Morgan. Uh -huh. Because Pierre Morgan, that, you know, yeah, know broadcaster in the US, yes. UK, mm. I think is a, is an inherent racist, an imperialist. I was shocked at his statement. Uh -huh. He took on two people, a young girl who had participated in a campaign to say, the king is not my king, because okay. they, they were Republicans. Other young man who was participated in disrupting Wimbledon and other places. Uh -huh. And he shouted at him and said, hey, why are you not going to China and India who consume more power? <laughs> why are you only in the UK? Uh -huh. And this man said, look, the Indian consume one-tenth the power per capita, UK does. Mm. The Chinese consume maybe one-fifth. Why should you go there? And China is going to change the function. No, no, but you won't go there. You're not courageous. You're going there. So what? He's disregarding data. Yes. And that's what the Americans say. India should reduce. You want this uh, candidate for, uh, uh, who's the Indian lady who's a candidate for the UK, for the presidency of the United States? Nikki Haley? I mean, I mean, presidency of the United States from the US, South Carolina. 
Nikki Haley. Ah, Nikki Haley. Yes. She said India and China should reduce. Man, look at per capita income. There are 8 billion people on the planet. Everybody has a right to consume certain amount of energy. Yes. The Americans consume 10 times the energy that we consume. America consumes 25% of the global energy. There are maybe 4% of the world's population. Right. Europe uh, consumes uh, maybe 20% and there are maybe 5-6% of the world population. And China consumes about maybe uh, 15%, there's 17% of the world population. Yet China as a country, 1.4 billion people, has a huge consumption. India, 1. Point billion, but per capita is low. Hmm. So he's trying to equate a country, UK, 65 million with 1.4 billion and say, you guys reduce. Makes no sense. He must have some sense in his head. Yes. There's no sense. There's a kind of debate that happens. Hmm. So we must show them for what they are. Yes. I think the US still has this frontier mindset that use everything and dispose everything is disposable. I no, mean that, that comes of see, see Abhiji, that comes of unbridled wealth. Yes. It's a rich country. Yes. So you need education. Yes. You need education. You need your faculty and everybody to say, please consume, etc. Consume less. That movement has to happen. But that movement is against some corporate interest because corporate interest is based upon increased revenues, increased wages, more, right. more and more and more and more. So when you're saturated to it till here, what is more and more and more and more? But I think it'll happen. The entire economy is driven by consumption. Yeah. They consume so 85%. much. 85%. 85 percent. If the Americans stop wasting food, the world yes. will be better. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they stop consuming, uh, uh, you know, beef in the way. Yes. Uh, it'll be better. They know the data. They know mm -hmm. everything. But I think there more debate has to be done. Absolutely. More education has to be done. Right. Even in India, we have people who are bought over by the West saying India should do this India without looking into data. Yes, right. See, India should go towards carbon neutrality and that is a done deal. Mm. And that there should be no debate. The question is, should it be 2070 or earlier? Yes. So we committed globally 2070. We should try to do it earlier. Mm. And to do it earlier, government policies should be there. They're putting in policies. Corporates should take the lead for the businesses. And we as individual consumers should do it in our own houses. Yes. And I think it's important. All three work together. It will work. Why can't we walk three, four kilometers in our cities instead of taking a car? Yes, right. When we are poorer, we took a cycle and we walked. Now we become richer, we become fatter, we become less healthy. We take a two-wheeler or a car for mm. a short distance. Why should we? Yes, right. We need AC, yes. But we don't need AC 24 hours a day right. in our homes. Mm. Offices are different because they're a very different thing. Yes. But all I'm saying is we must change our living practices, reduce wastage. And the solution lies there, which can give a relief within two or three years. Right. So, we will focus on renewable energy and all that, but right now we still need fossil fuels for most it's of our It's declining. Work. It's declining. See, I read an article of data which says uh, last month, I think 15 or 16 percent of India's energy consumption was alternate energy. Okay. That's significant. UK is 35, 40 percent. Europe is 30, 40 percent. I see. I mean, you look at latest data and publish it. I see. Uh, mm. It's happening. Right. It's a big way. Mm -hmm. But you can't do it with coal you because can't. you need a base load. Yes. You need coal, you need a base load, mm. but we can put electronic precipitators. You know, here is something interesting for you, Abhijit. Maybe you can do some research. Uh -huh. You see, if you look at satellite data for the last 20 years, there's a three kilometer layer of smog from Peshawar to Dhaka. Okay. In the winter, it comes down and creates pollution in Delhi and uh -huh. other places. <coughs> in the summer, it goes up. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cross the Himalayas because the Himalayas are eight kilometers up. Yes. So it gets stuck there. Uh -huh. What are the components? Components are the dust from the Sahara, which swirls through. Okay, from research. Sahara. Yeah. Okay. The dust from the Gobi and uh, possibly the Thar Desert and the Middle East. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, next is 1 billion tons of coal being burnt in the subcontinent from that area. Okay. Which has 30% ash. Mm -hmm. Actually, we are consuming 1.2 billion, but 1 billion has got 30% ash. Okay. And we don't have electronic precipitate, it goes into the sky. Okay. And that is uh, maybe 30, 300 million tons of ash in the sky. Correct? Mm, okay. And then the next thing will be local dust, because we are a dry country, so yes. dust from the thing. Yes. You've seen in Delhi and see in Bangalore, in the summer, they will clean the road dust, put it by the side or put it in the drain. They don't <laughs> take it away. In Delhi, you should not, any city, you should not have an unpaved surface, yes. which is either paved or not green. Yes, that's right. So, dust doesn't come up. The yes. dust comes up, comes down the evening. Comes up, comes evening. You go to Delhi, old Delhi, no, the old, not new Delhi, old Delhi and see so much of bug, debris. Clean the place up. Can you also clean it up? Only very little comes from cars. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court passed a judgment saying 2000 cc SUV should be banned or something like that. Punches, okay. right? Okay. 
2000 cc SUVs have the latest technology, possibly they discharge less carbon than a truck which is 15 years old. Hmm. I mean, we must use latest technology to find out, right? Right, right. So I think we must have very clear policies and tackle this pollution first. So like that, we require data. So this is a very complex thing, but there are many things that we can do as a society to tackle the problem. Right. What's your opinion about India's economic prospects, economic growth? Do you think we are growing fast enough? You know, Abhijit, I love data and I talk about it. Yes. Let me give you some data. Okay. 1950, when we got our freedom, mm -hmm. we were the richest country in Asia. China was destroyed in the war. Yes. Japan was destroyed in the war. Yes. Southeast Asia was destroyed in the war. Yes. India was the only country left. And India had a very strong industrial base for the war effort. Hmm. Of the five richest families in Asia, three were Indian. Okay. Great Britain owed us 1.5 billion for the war effort. Mm -hmm. Of course, within three, four years, they devalued the pound and everything and we lost money because Nehru just didn't understand how to tackle this. You must do some research and see what happened. People are written about it. Okay. Now, what did Nehru do? Nehru, because of his obsession with the Soviet Union and obsession with the Fabian School, mm. created an economic policy where he said the public sector shall have the commanding heights of the economy, 1956 Abadi resolution, and he started suppressing private capital in India. Okay. Till then, free markets and private capital has driven India's economy. 1750, we and China were 45 percent of world GDP. Yes. From the start of the Christian era to 2000, we were the richest country in the world. Yes. Why is that? We are a riverine civilization. We had agricultural surpluses. And once you have surpluses, people will uh, turn to uh, skilled uh, artisans. Yes. We had a huge number of skilled artisans. We had great philosophers. We don't have to work for a living because society will take care of them. Yes. We had great thoughts and everything else. We had 14 universities before the Islamic invasion. Yes. And the Islamic invaders never built one university. All these people who praise the Mughals and ask them, oh, they built Taj Mahal. Okay, you built Taj Mahal. They, use, money. they suppress they suppress the people and yes. tell them mausoleum. It's a mausoleum. Did they build one single university? They destroyed it. Yes. Nalanda, they destroyed. We still have that uh, railway station named after the destroyer Bakhtiar of Nalanda. Kilji. What a bloody shame. Yes, it's like shameful. a sword in the heart of Indians. So, he suppressed private capital uh -huh. and the result was very clear. From 1950 to 1980, we grew at 3.5% a year. Yes. What that uh, leftist economy, Raj Krishna, derisively called Hindu. the Hindu rate of growth. Yes. Because abusing Hindus is part for the course. It is. It Hindus is. are poor, ignorant people. We are the elite. We are the represented the imperial order, the British land. We rule Delhi. We tell you what to do. That attitude yes. has to go. That yes. Lutians Delhi still has that attitude. Mm. So, they, India grew at 3.5. Population grew at 2.5%. Per capita income grew 1%. 1%? Yes. I graduated from my college with a BCom degree in 1979. Okay. 1982, I got a university rank. I mm. finished my CA in 82. I okay. got an All India rank. I see. I had 10 job offers, not a single one in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. But we are a defeated people. Young mm -hmm. people were defeated. You know, Diwar captures the essence of a defeated country. Diwar. And a lost country. Diwar. Amitabh Bachchan. Amitabh Bachchan. Shashikabur. The story is very poignant. Here is a idealistic trade union leader. He fights for his people. And the Babus and the old uh, elite in Bombay decide they will fix it. Mm -hmm. They capture his children and kidnap them and tell him you sign on the agreement. So he signs an agreement and his people turn under him and they catch his son and say, Mera baap chor hai, and destroy him. He leaves his family and he goes away in the train to wander like a man without a country everywhere. I see. And so the mother takes these two young boys to Bombay because those days everybody went to Bombay. Yes. I think the reason the slums and all come up because the movie said, you're the country yokel who has fallen in love with somebody and he is getting oppressed. He has no hope. He is poor. So he runs away to Bombay, makes money and the country yokel becomes rich. Because so every, all the North Indian belt went to Bombay. Hmm. <laughs> think about it. Yes. There's the movies. We always saw the movie, right? There was disparate. Yes. So, he came to Bombay and they stay in a slum and the, and the elder boy works as a shoe shiner mm -hmm. to get money to educate the younger son. Okay. Younger son goes to college. This man shoe shines and my shoe shining one day gets a great smuggler. Doesn't know a smuggler. Uh -huh. And the smuggler, you know, throws a coin to him out of finish. Then he looks at him and says, Nikal ke haat mein do, maine aapka kaam kiya hai. Uh -huh. And the smuggler removes and gives him a lambi der ka goda hai, he says. <laughs> That's Ajit, I think. Okay. Or somebody, not Ajit, somebody else, not Ajit. Okay. Mm. And very soon, he takes a job 
in a uh, in a in a, in, the, in the bombay port there he finds this goons taking money from every port employee when they get a salary roll uh -huh. call uh -huh. they should take money which i think some of the political parties they keep doing right so then he fights against them and one say old mamu because in all this uh, javed akhtar movies the mamus are the muslims are very kind and very considerate the hindus Naturally. are the oppressors yes yes so they deliberately done you must see a, a, a i am professor was written how the dialogue was anti hindu anti purohit anti indians anti hindu where it is pro, pro muslim deliberately uh, in doing that era okay okay because mm. the maulvi was a good kind man the priest was a bad man etc mm. anyway th this movie shows all that okay. i never understood it till i read that report i see because you know i just saw it as a movie mm. so what happens uh, then that uh, mamu goes and uh, I'm saying, Mamu, with respect, you know. I please don't get go after me. He, he, he fights and says, "I won't give the money. My child is something." And they push him, and a vehicle comes rolling over him and okay. dies. Okay, I see. Then he gives his billa badge, hmm. seven eight six. So you know what is seven eight six? No, it's some very Islamic. Okay, holy number. I why, see. why do Islamic holy number for here? Javed Akhtar did it deliberately. I see. And he took takes it and says, "Ap roko, ap kar karega." So this man fights against them and defeats. Then he becomes a smuggler, mm -hmm. and he becomes very rich. Mm. He becomes very rich because why? He's doing wrong, and his younger brother graduates, fall in love with a girl, blah blah blah, but never gets a job. Okay. Everywhere, wherever he's selected, the Malik calls up the committee and says, "Isko job do." So finish nepotism. That's mm. what is there. Okay. So doesn't get a job. Finally, he joins the government and becomes a police officer. I see. Okay, mm -hmm. and then suddenly he understands what his brother has done. Brother is a big smuggler. Okay. So one day, the elder brother comes to his. He goes to his mother, to elder brother, and say, "Tu smuggler ban gaya hai, tu to ye ban gaya, ye ban gaya." And then Amitabh Bachchan gives a famous speech, and he gets angry. "Dekho, maine mere haath se ye sab kam kiya hai. Tere paas kya hai? Mere paas bangla hai, mere paas paisa hai, mere paas sab kuch hai. Tere paas kya hai? Then he makes the mere paas mere paas ma hai." Yes, very famous dialogue. Then the break, the family breaks, hmm. and he goes away alone. This is the guy who was sacrificed. Yes, he has done wrong, but that is what it is. Broken country. Hmm. Those countries. Uh, you know, uh, there were two Lala Karim and uh, Haji Mastan. Gangsters, they smugglers, yes. gangsters. They were yes. the favored people in Bombay. They were the heroes. Mm. They were the gangsters. They were the heroes in society. Mm. Because everything was broken. This Nehru's policy impact even those days. And then, and then what happened? This this guy fires, then he goes after him, and then when he shoots him, this billa protects him. Wonderful. <laughs> huh, because you know this all planted. Right. It means you know one god will protect you if you wear it. Mm. Then he goes to a temple, goes to a murti, and fights the murti. What have you done for me? Look at what you have done for me. Blah blah blah. To say Hindus will never get anything from the god. They always oppress. There is no god. They have no power, etc. And then the police come and shoot him, and his mother comes and he dies on his mother's lap. I see. Now who is a tragic person? He's a tragic. That shows the that shows the youth of India at that point of time. A broken country with no future. So India opened up in 1980, but in 80 to 90 we grew at 5.5 percent, population grew at 2.25 percent, and uh, uh, per capita income grew at 3.25 percent. I get one percent. Okay. So, but our debt grew from 20 billion to 80 billion. Okay. So we are broke in 91. Uh huh. 91 uh, liberalisation was forced because we are broke, not because uh, Manmohan Singh did some great things. He had no. Manmohan Singh had, no... had never done anything useful in his life. He only obeyed his master, <laughs> except for the nuclear deal where he stood up. Okay. He never did anything. He's like a mouse. Hmm. He's a good man, but like a mouse, he never stood up for anything, mm -hmm. and he never could enforce it well. He did whatever his master did. Most of the draconian laws came with him when he was in a ministry. So they opened up. That time our GDP was two seventy five billion. That has grown to three point two four trillion today. Yes. Thirty first of March, eight point two percent a year in dollar terms for thirty two thirty two years. Mm. This is incredible. Yes. The only country which has grown faster in history is China, which has grown ten nearly ten percent a year for forty years. Yes. And the GDP grew from five lakh twenty five thousand crores to about two hundred seventy three lakh crores. Mm. Data is there. Yes. Thirteen point two percent in rupees. Yes. It's incredible what has happened. You don't see it in patches because our infrastructure is very bad. You go to China, you see great infrastructure, new towns, new building. They spent a lot, and you think is really rich. Here, a lot of things have happened to people. Our life quality has gone up. There's less poverty, but you don't see it because all our public infrastructure sucks because of corruption, lack of application. So, will India grow to? Uh, 10 trillion soon yes i think india will be close to 5 trillion by 2026 okay 
is the dollar rupee rate. When Sanjeev Sanyal said India will be 5 trillion by 2025, he said it will be at a dollar rate of 75. 75. Okay, not 80 now. Now it is 8. That time it was 75. Yes. Then because of COVID, it went to 82. Right. So India's problem has been the depreciation of the rupee. The depreciation of the rupee. I'll tell you why the depreciation of the rupee is, uh, you know, happens. So, we will grow. This year, we're supposed to grow at 305 lakh crores. Okay. 24, March. Uh -huh. So, if we grow 12% again, that's about 360, right? Mm -hmm. Then we grow at... Um, 12% again, another two years, that is 25, 26, will be close to uh, 400 lakh crores. Okay. That will be close to 5 trillion. Okay. And will we grow from there? Yes, we are growing because 65% of the GDP, 65, 65% of GDP is consumption in India, 35% uh, is 30% uh, 30, 30 is investment, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, we are investing a trillion dollars a year in mm -hmm. CapEx. All these idiots say no CapEx growth, no nothing like CMI. CMI is, gives you bullshit. Look at the Mosby report which says how much you invested in agriculture in every sector. We are investing, we got a savings rate of 30%, investment of 31.5%. 31.5% on 3.34 trillion is a trillion dollars. Uh -huh. We're investing a trillion dollars. It's huge, man. It's huge. Yes. 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 Investment is happening. Jobs are being created. I'll show you jobs report which say that India is getting 1.2 crore, 1.3 crore new jobs every year. Every year. Because they all enroll into the EPFO. Okay. EPFO, when you enroll, you have an other number, so it's a very unique number. And 50% of jobs is by below the age of 25, uh, below the age of 26. Mm -hmm. Because the EPFO for the last 48 months has been given a, a total number of enrollment by gender, by five age groups, uh -huh. by state, okay. and by industry. I see. Very if you good. analyze that and say this is available publicly in the EPFO MOSPI website. None of these Lutians really is leftist economists care to do it because it goes against the narrative of jobless, where is growth? Mm. Now, in the Modi era, GDP has grown from 113 lakh crores to 273 lakh crores. Okay. 160 lakh crores. Don't think jobs have been created, Abhijit? Naturally. For 160 lakh crores? Of course. Yes. Huge amount of jobs have been created. In the whole of South India, you're not getting people for jobs. Okay. They say the metro construction is behind for uh, four months because we're not able to get masons, we're not able to get this. Even in hotels, you are not able to get people. Now, the Biharis are coming. Everybody is coming. Kerala has got 10% Bihari population. You see Hindi signs. For a Bihari in Kerala who gets 1,250 rupees a day for being a mason, that's like Dubai, man. I see. That he gets 30,000 rupees. He's mm. sending money back to Bihar. Okay. He's a modern Dubai. Mm. So, immigrants are coming in all hospitality in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka. Northeastern women are coming. Okay. Northeastern boys are coming into restaurants. I see. They're all doing the work. So you can see this huge migration because of economic development uh -huh. that is happening. So we'll see. Nehru destroyed the Indian economy and impoverished us. Yes. By 1980, we are poorer compared to the rest of the world than 1950. Mm. From 1950 to 1980, the world grew at 4.5% a year. Mm. Asia grew at 6.5% a year. Mm. We grew at 3.5% a year. So, we were poorer on mm. a little basis. The world lost respect for us. Yes, yes, that's what they happened. They said, you know, you are a broken country, you are nothing. Nobody gave you respect. When I used to go with my passport, they used to look up Indian, ha, 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 make me stand by the side, do everything. I faced racism in Germany. I see. I faced racism in Germany. I see. In mm. the thing, in England, I faced sometimes. They look, of course, the English do it in a very devious way. Mm. I faced racism in New Zealand. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because, oh, you're Indian. Uh -huh. Now, they respect you because of IT and other things. Yes. And they'll respect you more because you're a powerful country. Yes. You're getting richer. So, Nehru destroyed it. We got over because Gandhiji said, This desh mein sarkar vyapari hai, us desh mein janta bikari hai. <laughs> How can you invest mm. people's money as tax into public sector to compete against your own people? Air India mm. required 1,35,000 crore taxpayers' money to pay off all our liabilities. Right. They lost 1,35,000 <clears throat> crores. Who nationalized Air India and ruined it? Hmm. Government cannot run business. Yes. Okay, they can never run business. In some strategic areas like NTPC, like power grid, it could work. Not in other areas. Right. Look at our BMRTC, our buses here. 6,000 buses for the last 10 years. I see. You know, 10, 15 percent workforce doesn't come. Average salary is 65, 70,000 rupees. Wow. I'm on the board of educational institution in, um, in Hyderabad. Uh -huh. a, a driver after 30 years, gets 1,20,000 rupees a month cost to company. I see. Because the government, they see the government servant, we follow the government pay scale. I see. They don't have to work. Anybody joining the government, people say, many people say, you don't get a salary, you get a pension. Mm. 
Because, you know, you join at 25, your salary keeps going up, indexed to inflation till 60, and then your pension keeps going. What the hell is this? Yeah, what about us? We pay for them. What do we get? Corruption. We get the treated like shit. Everything else. All because of this mindset, the state shall do that. Uh, that our intellectual arrogance. I am there to do. I know better than you. Yes. Gandhiji said we must have village empires. He wanted a bottoms up approach. Nehru wanted a top down approach. Yes, we need a top down to certain areas to bring in modernity to build infrastructure. Mm. Rest to be bottoms up. Yes. You know Nehru when when Mao took over in 1949, he educated China's women literacy. He said women hold up half of heaven. Nehru did not educate India's women. Did not educate. Look at the literacy rate for women in 1990. Okay. You get the data and see yourself. Uh -huh. Because it is his policy who continued till then. Yes, right. You look at it, literacy rate by 1970, 1980. And compare that with China. Mm. China's literacy today is 96%. India is still 78%. I see. Because we still have that generation which is not literate. Literacy. If Gandhi would have said every village, panchayat should start a own school and educate all girls and boys. That is our culture. Uh -huh. We had, before the British came, we had village schools where everybody Bihar. came. You know yes. that. Yes. You've seen all that. Yes. He, just, he didn't do it because he wanted, oh, I'll put IIT. Even IIT, he didn't do it. I think Bidan Bose did it. You know that. He said, I will put these temples of modern. This is great. But temples of modern India cannot exist with huts of modern India. <laughs> yes, right. So primary health and primary education should have been focused. Didn't happen. Now it's happening. You're seeing productivity going up. Yes. Women empower going up. Yes. If women had become literate, we wouldn't be having 1.4 billion people today. Mm -hmm. Maybe 1 billion people. Would have been a much richer country, much better country, much more educated country. Mm -hmm. So this is what is happening. So I believe that we'll grow to 10 trillion by 2032, provided the dollar rupee rate remains the same. Okay. We are growing, consumption is growing, our banking system is in great shape. We have some giant companies, they're all in great shape, they're competing, etc. They have to globalize. Mm -hmm. The only flaw in the industrial model is the Chinese, right from the beginning, said when they grew, we want to monopol we want to dominate the world in manufacturing. Manufacturing. The Chinese have 1.2 billion tons of steel. Operating margin 2 to 3 percent, like Sajan Dindal said. Okay. We make 125 million tons of steel. Operating margin 15 to 16 percent. My goodness. So, Indian industry is dominated on profits. Mm. But China dominated on scale. Scale. And they have been able to build up scale and become dominant leaders. So, Indian industry should now focus on global scale exports. Because no Export. country has grown in human history without exporting. Yes. We have to export. We have to be competitive and grow in scale. And once you have scale, cost of manufacturing comes down. Mm. Then your own people can afford more. China found that people's income moves slowly, 5 to 6 percent. So if you want 10, 11 percent growth, you must bring the <coughs> price of what they buy down so mm. they can buy more. Right. And that will drive down uh, your uh, raw material uh, costs because you can, you can do more. Yes. And scale has its advantages. Yes. And China did it beautifully. In 1979, I think they opened up and had a one-child policy. First, they said for 10 years, we will give freedom to agriculture because farmers could plant what they want, do what they want. Agriculture production doubled in 10 years. Then they said we'll have an SCZ around the uh, coast, whole districts. And anybody can come. Then they got young women from the interior to be to be put into hostel, work 12 hours a day, six days a week, opera, whatever they did. They got them jobs and skills. They become an exporter. Then they build great port infrastructure for export. Then they build railroads and everything interiors. Then they started investing in high-tech manufacturing. They went up the value chain yes, yes. because they developed skills and they're famous for robbing technology. And then they uh -huh. built 1,000 universities and they told me when I went, they call it, they want the quality of IIT. 35 million young Chinese are in college mm. and uh, they focus on higher education. They spend $150 billion on AI. That's what they said. We mm. want to be an AI dominant power. Right. They're very clear and focused. Yes. The only person who's clear and focused in this country is Prime Minister Modi. Nobody He's has. done many things. Because they don't understand, they don't want to do it. Right. I mean, you see the young princeling who is going around, what is he talking? Mm. Is he talking about a great modern India producer jobs? He's talking about victimhood narratives. Every, you're a victim, I'm a victim, I'll give you money, I'll give this. You like our uh, Congress, which won? I mean, two crore women are going to get 2,000 rupees a month. Is that what they want? They want jobs for the they children. Jobs, obviously. Yes. They want better education. Yes. They want better infrastructure. 52,000 crores has been absorbed into the budget. Uh -huh. Karnataka is fiscally strong. For a per capita income of 3,83,000 rupees, do you require all these freebies? I am, I am for poor people, the Antyodhya class, mm -hmm. getting everything. For them, because they're really poor. Not for everybody else about that class. Right. Let them work. Let them struggle. You have Human beings have to struggle. There's no starvation in the state. 
So you give for certain people, 15, 20 percent of people, you give what you want. Yes. Then it's okay. Not for everybody. That's the problem. Everybody gets it and that is very wrong. Mm -hmm. Because who is paying for it? 10 percent of people are paying for it. Yes. Why should they pay for it? One day they'll get upset and say, why the hell should I pay? Yes. Then they'll start evading taxes. Another you can do. Yes, right. Correct. Yes, you sir. can't suppress 10 percent of Bangalore gives 65 percent, 60 percent of taxes. Gets 10 percent of the budget uh, investment. Peanuts. We suffer here. But we are the richest city, $11,000 per capita income. I see. Yeah, richest okay. city in India, richer than Bombay and Delhi. Okay. 23 lakh people work in technology, more than Silicon Valley. Mm. And we export 65, uh, nearly $80 billion of software every mm. year. I see. We got $64 billion of capital for startups. It's an extraordinary city. Mm. There's no city like Bangalore or the whole of India. Mm. And you screw it up by taking the money, putting elsewhere till people get disgusted. Right. Anyway, that's the kind of politics that has to happen. So my view is very simple. We will reach 10 trillion. We will grow. And I think there are enough forces to make it happen. We have great managements, great companies, good corporate governance. There are some failures which have happened. But we need a positive attitude. Agreed. We need a positive attitude in our states. But the growth will happen by the states. By the states. Whatever policy centered as an investment will be there. But they yes. can't do more. Yes, yes. yes. So let's see what uh, UP is developing. In, um, in UP is developing. It's developing very well. Maharashtra, you know, the political city has ruined Maharashtra. Gujarat mm. is developing. Mm. UP is developing. Madhya Pradesh is de Madhya Pradesh grown agriculture by 20% CAGR for 8 years. I see. So, Madhya Pradesh is growing. Karnataka has grown so far despite all this lousy politics. Uh -huh. Tamil Nadu is so and so. Kerala is a gone case. Telangana has done very well. The father and son duo has done very well for them. Even okay. though people say they are very corrupt and all that. Okay. In fact, I think... Uh, the father once said publicly, I don't know whether it's correct, somebody told me that he's willing to finance the entire opposition for the 24 election. Where will he get the money? <laughs> you have a state as a backyard, right? I as a one personal asset. I you see. do that. But if they're done well for the people, they've done a lot of things. Hyderabad has become a much more remarkable city because it's a small state. Okay. So maybe it needs a smaller state. Mm. In Andhra Pradesh, they've gone backward because the debt has gone up. They've become a, a state led by pastors. Evangelicals have taken over, they are doing all kind of mess. You must look at what is happening in the state, it's pathetic. I see. I see. How will the state develop? I really don't know. But anyway, I think we states should have policies to develop. West Bengal is gone. West Bengal is pathetic, man. Mm -hmm. You know, Bihar's per capita income this year should be around 60,000 rupees. Okay. UP is 90,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. Karnataka is 3,83,000 rupees. What have they done to Bihar? This Ram Mohan, Loya, socialism, socialism, Nitish Babu and all kind of rubbish that talk. What have they done to Bihar? Hmm. They have not done much to improve. Yes, they build roads, given water and all that. But where are the jobs? Where is education? Bihar has the lowest gross enrollment rate, 13 or 14 percent. India is 27 percent. Uh, but uh, West Bengal is 19 percent. West Bengal is a pathetic economic failure. Right. And that is hurting the whole of East India. Mm -hmm. So, I think a lot of things are happening. To understand India, you must look at the various states. There is nothing like one India thing. See the various states, who is growing. Because most of the states are bigger than countries in Europe. Indeed. Yes. So, that's why when people abuse India and say, take one instance here, somebody, some crime here and say, India is a communal, you get angry because that's not India, man. We have 1.4 billion people. I mean, you talk about crimes in India, talk about crime per million population. Exactly. Yes. Not one. We will always have huge numbers because the 1.4 billion people, the only country you must compare is China. Yes. 1.4 billion people is not easy. You understand? Yes. So I think got to be very careful and people compare and people like you should push back and expose them. Mm -hmm. Because all the leftists say, for example, these reporters without borders or something. Uh -huh. Six people were uh, put in jail or something, so there's no press freedom. Okay. 450 channels, 2,500 newspapers. Every day they abuse the government <laughs> on do. TV, yeah. everywhere. Yes. And out of the six journals, journalists, I think, two of them were Kashmiri terrorist supporters. Okay. Okay. And mm. they got court has put them inside. And that one or two of them were people were caught up for uh, uh, extorting money or something. I see. So if you look at uh, per million population, India is way down. Way down, yes. Other countries are way higher. Yes. And they're supposed to be democracies, free democracy. We are an electoral autocracy. What rubbish is that? <laughs> if people abuse India for its democracy, where is democracy in the world? There's no future for the world. Yes. India is 1.4 billion people, 17% of humanity. Man, we are a democratic country because it's inbuilt into a culture. We are a very diverse country because of Hinduism. Yes. Because of what we are. Yes. We are a very open liberal society where people can do what they want. The highest form of liberalism 
in any society is when you can oppose the dogma and say there is no God. Yes, right. That is the highest form of liberalism because that is the fight against domination. Yes. Is in India very well. Yes, totally. Nothing happens. You try the Islamic countries, they will go after you. Christianity, yes, they will debate their lesser because they are broken. Correct? Yes, yes. <laughs> so, I am saying, if you don't respect India and go on abusing it by cooking up data, getting data only from 2000 lefties who write to you, answer your survey, same people. They must say, who are the people as the surveys? Same set of people. The same Lutyens Delhi's, the same elite, broken elite. Mm. And what have they done? Let me give you another piece of data. Almost all the elite want the children to go to US universities. Yes. Many of them in bureaucracy and other places manipulate it by getting some scholarship because mm. it's expensive. Mm. And when the children grow, they don't want them to come back. Yes. So what is it they're dictating to us? Nobody should advise anybody in this country unless they're willing to suffer the consequences of their advice. Yes. And the consequent advice is suffered by the children. Yes. You send off your children abroad and you are 60 and you want advisors, what to bullshit, man. Because your children are not here, they're not going to suffer the consequences. Why do you want to advise me? Let me say what is there. Correct? Yes. Policy should be done by people who are going to be impacted by the policy. Mm -hmm. Not by people who are so old, they're not going to be impacted because they think they got uh, buddhi. I don't know what buddhi that is. Right. So I think we've got to be careful about that. And all that proves that we have to look at India very uh, differently. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we have 7,50,000 young people, uh, Indians, getting educated overseas. They spend maybe $20 billion. Mm. That LRS is about $21 billion a year, half of it to go for education. Okay. What Nirmala has done is very wrong for various reasons. But the key is out of this 750,000, maybe 200,000 are gone to get good education. Mm. Rest of all gone to third date universities, all kind of thing, emigrate. Uh, to emigrate, yes. They're very clear. Yes. Why will a, a Sadar young man sell his land and go learn some stupid English and go to a thing? He wants to emigrate. Yes. They're going. We should send them off. We should take it to a million, two million, send them off. Let them go. Mm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You go out. You stay there. Mm. We already have the largest diaspora in the, in the world. Yes. So, we should be liberal in them and if anybody wants to leave the country, become a citizen anyway, fine. That's why, you know, I was disappointed with Amir Khan that did not leave this country. You should leave him <laughs> go, man. I mean, Turkey met the Erdogan's wife. Like, yes, he, he did. There. He did. Let him go. Sure, yeah. Why abuse us? Oh, my wife has fear. I'll go, go, go. Everybody go. <laughs> why should we defend them? M.F. Hussein hmm. went and left Doha, fine. He became an uh, art object for the Doha royal family. Uh -huh. So he went, yes. because you see, we were so very liberal at one point of time, he painted Hindu religious figures naked Nude. and all that. Yes, I'm aware. We all accepted it. We didn't yes. care about that. Yes. Okay. There were no consequences. But he never did it for his own religion. Not one. Not one. Yes. Let him try. I respect anybody who does have the same standard for everybody, irrespective of background. For example, Charlie Hebdo uh, make, made irrelevant things irreverent things against everybody, against the Pope, Islam, everybody. Mm -hmm. They had no agenda mm -hmm. except to poke fun and satire. But the Memphis did only for this. So when people protested, when I looked at it, I said, yes, they got grounds to protest because you have not lived up to what people expect. You're not a true liberal. You can't be so focused on one. You understand? Yes, totally. Which people forget. Yes. And blame people who protested. Mm -hmm. Oh, you draw him, let him go. Yeah. You want to leave, go. Yes. Nobody is forcing you to stay in this country. People want to stay, will stay. That's a liberal society. Right. Am I right? Yes, totally. So why should they don't know if you're getting back? India will lose. India never loses here. We've been around 5,000 years. We'll be around for 10,000. Forget about it. Is the diaspora an asset for India? Diaspora is an asset and a liability. Both. Because the diaspora, which has become part of the diaspora, become very abusive against India, which is indulging in fake reports, trying to do many things like Raghuram Rajan, Arvind ah. Subramaniam, uh -huh. Kaushik Basu, run fake narratives against uh -huh. India. So Raghuram Rajan, shows some kind of uneasiness about doing it. Okay. Kaushik Bachu is very clear. The man then asks him, taxi, is, is, he does what is called taxi economics. And oh, yes, taxi, di uh, taxi driver economics. Uh, taxi uh, driver uh, economics. Yes, and, uh, yes. Arvind Subramaniam does the same thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't need them. And they are the ones in faculty and everybody driving this caste narrative. India is a missing organistic. India is a caste. We don't need them yet. Mm. We should disown all these people. Right. Now, that guy, Joker, uh, Robert, the uh, Swain, Swain. Swain, yeah, Ashok Swain. Ashok Swain. Good God. Today is a case uh, in the court because they took out his OIC 
you know oic and pio pio card or card. whatever it is yeah. and you are saying oh i'm an academic i'm the unesco chair for this he's a very abusive bigoted character look yes. at all these tweets and his writing yes. he's abusive and bigoted why should he give him a privilege of coming back we remove the privilege no pio card is a privilege not a right it's not a right because you're not an indian citizen yes you're not an indian citizen is a right yes so the court has said your order denying him that is not detailed do that but why should it be, be supported I mean, why do you need these Khalistanis mm. who go fight and burn the Indian flag, remove their OIC PIO? Mm. They're fine. They made a choice. They're outside. Okay. They're no friends of India. Yes. We should take tough stand. Definitely. We should take a tough stand. Have you ever seen an American come to India and abuse America? It's, it, it'll never happen. Ah. Never. Never. Yes. But we do it. We, we do it. Yeah. Because, you know, we are broken, we are bought over. And for many of these academics, selling India, abusing India is a key. It's Look key. at Rashmi Savan's book, what she says, mm -hmm. how she suffered. Right? Subtle racism in Oxford, okay. in Cambridge. That's the key. Uh -huh. Because these Indians are sold their souls to the white man and they go abuse the country. And they go up in their esteem and they abuse this country more. But they've been out for 20 years. They don't know what is happening in this country. Yes. So they pick up one incident in India. This, who cares a shit? And that's why more young Indians are standing up for the country and say, you are no longer a thing. Forget it. We will not respect you. Yes. There's a young, assertive India coming up. And that is a great future. We believe in the civilization, believe in what they are and believe in the country first. Mm -hmm. That's what Modi has done. And that's very good. Mm -hmm. We should jettison this whole generation who sold their souls to the white man yes. into all these countries. We still abuse them. Mm -hmm. So part of the diaspora is a big strength. There are many of them in business, others who feel for this country who come. Right. Part of them are not. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember my colleague in Infosys saying she, her uh, family, one person had come here and she said, oh my God, you got a big house, you got a big car. Oh, we have it there. You know, I got a big house in the US. Yes, she said, you got a mortgage. I don't have a mortgage. I don't mm -hmm. have any debt. <laughs> They're all shocked that we're doing so well. Right, yes. In fact, I was in a seminar in Chicago in the World Hindu Congress. Mm -hmm. I was in a panel. Okay. In that panel, one uh, American Indian, Indian American came and said, oh, India can't do this, India can't do that, India can't do this, blah, 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 blah. Ten minutes went on rubbishing India. Then I stood up and said, you know, gentlemen, I want to tell you one thing. Yes, India has got many problems. India has got many challenges. We are an impoverished, looted country. Yeah, we made a mistake. But now we are coming up, we are doing this. Please remember, we are staying back, fighting the battle, growing the economy, paying our taxes. Yes. Is our country. You left this country for better economic prospects 20 years ago. What is the stake in the country? Nothing. You are nothing but an economic refugee. You yes. left it for economic status. You are an economic refugee, man. And you are preaching to us. I said, don't preach. We can debate and you can advise them, but don't preach. We are not going to accept it anymore. Mm -hmm. Openly in the audience of 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. Some of the NRS felt very bad. I said, you are economic refugees. It's a fact. It's a fact. Yes. It's a fact. Yes. You don't want to help India. We are fine here. We don't need it. Don't abuse India. Don't, uh, you know, do run fake narratives against India. Correct? Yes. Ah, that's it. Mm -hmm. We respect you. And this tendency amongst Indians to jump up and down with joy. Oh, Satya Nadella has become, you know, <laughs> president of, you know, what is the CEO of... Uh, okay, great. We should applaud and that's it. Mm -hmm. Satya is not going to do anything for India uh, because he become president. He'll do it for his company. Totally. The company doesn't make it in India, it's not going to do anything. Forget it. We should not have this expectation. I don't get why we get so excited when an because Indian we succeeds. A, because we have this third rate attitude of insecurity. Oh, they done well. You can't do well in India. India, this is the, our startup entrepreneurs done so well. They do well. India's economy is only 3.4 trillion. There, the GDP is 25 trillion. That's a different ball game, man. Yes. Our fortunes there are much bigger. Hmm. So we are growing. We'll grow there. We made wrong choices in the first 35, 40 years. We are suffering for that even now. If Nehru had just opened up the economy, we had grown at 4.5% or 6.5% in Asia grew, our GDP would have been maybe 12, 13 trillion. Right, yes. No, people should question that. Indeed. They will not question. They are all bought over people. Oh, Nehru, I, Nehru, Nehru. Yes, he did many good things, but he did many wrong things also, which hurt India you know, very badly. Mm. What are the things the government can do to improve the state of manufacturing in India? Clearly, we need to export lots of stuff to the world. So, what can we do See, to improve? the PLI scheme is a very good scheme because it is tackling a very important thing where people say it is not viable for us to manufacture in this country because uh -huh. of supply chain lack of thing. Uh -huh. The PLI will give a benefit for that. It's a very good scheme. Okay. Because we should have done the PLI scheme 10-15 years ago. Instead of that, we gave some subsidy scheme, but PLI is very good. It's based on manufacturing 
and more uh, ed- and, uh, get a manufacturing. Okay. <coughs> Today, I think in uh, electronic assembly for mobile, value added has gone up to 20%. Hopefully, it should go to 30% when display devices are built in this country. Okay. But that is good news. Mm-hmm. That will happen because we are a large consumer. We should do it here. Second thing what they must do is they must make sure that the investment lead to lower logistic costs. Mm-hmm. Our logistic costs are 14% of GDP before GST and the roads. Now must have come down to 11% of GDP, must bring it down to 8%. Okay. So you can manufacture in the heart of India and ship it to the ports. China is 6 to 7%. Oh, I see. So our roads are being built, our railways. Our r- railways used to run at 25 kilometers an hour. Now they say we want at 45 kilometers an hour. Same rolling stock, 25 kilometers an hour. You run at 45, you need half of that, yeah. Your cars come down. Yes. So they're running it because these people in Lalu Gilu never understood what the railways were. And, it, and we were wrong to put some um, unthinking people there. Yes, and right. praise them and say, Lalu, ne ye kia. Lalu did nothing, is a Lalu. Hmm. And we must really say, tell people what they are. So I think that is important. The third thing is power costs. Our power costs are very high for industry because uh, they use the higher power cost to subsidize people. The subsidy should end, it should come from the budget. That's what the LCT bill says. And it says that the subsidy cannot be more than 20%, then we must end. They've still not done it. What is it? Still not done it because they promise free power, free this. Whose money is it? Yes. I mean, man in uh, Punjab is saying, I gave 21,000 crores of power. 21,000 crores, huge amount of money for Punjab. If you spend 10,000 crores of that in educating young Punjabis, you would have been better off in 10 years. Yes, right. It's a free power dega, ye dega. Same <clears throat> Kejriwal brainless uh, move, you know, because it's buying people, free power, free water. I mean, everything has a damn cost here. And cost is going up. Yes. Now I'm going to come down. You're taxing people and giving somebody free. What about the rest? Where is development? So, I think things are happening in a way where we will see development. So manufacturing can go up when you do this. And then the attitude of the Indian manufacturer has to change. Mm -hmm. That time, sorry, has not happened. Okay. So we have to give them greater scale because they have to look at exports. In two wheelers, Rahul Ajay Bajaj is exporting. Mm -hmm. Two wheelers, 25-30% of our vehicles are getting exported. Okay. Cars, Maruti is doing, others, Tata's and all should do it. So manufacturing. Steel. I mean, we should go up to 300 million tons and uh, export the steel. We're mm-hmm. not doing it because it's so profitable here. Every time the steel, China comes and dumps, they go to government, government raises a tariff. Come and say, forget it, man, you fight the battle. You're in like uh, Sachin Madhendal say, you got 2 to 3 percent, which is very low. But you got 15, 16 percent operating margin, man. Come down to 10 percent. Mm-hmm. So the attitude of global scale should come. It's coming now okay. because of technology, robotics and all that. Uh-huh. But that's where you must scale up. India has no shortage of capital for good companies. Mm-hmm. India has no shortage of markets the pricing is right. India has no shortage of managerial talent if you want to run. Mm-hmm. But the key thing is the vision and the passion of Indian entrepreneurs. Right. If 500 industry leaders say, we're going to have 25% revenues coming from exports in the next 10 years in manufacturing, India will change. Mm. Look at the IT software industry, Abhijit. Yes. Last year, we exported $200 billion of software. Right. 60% of global outsourcing comes here. 5.5 million people were employed. 500,000 were hired that year, largest in for any country in any year. Mm-hmm. 60% outsourced, 60, I mean, about 55, 60% is to America. Okay. $135 billion of money came in as foreign exchange. Mm-hmm. The rest was spent towards it. That's the history. Next is, of the top 10 software service companies by market value, five are Indian. Right. By market value. Uh-huh. Top five, three are Indian. TCS, then uh, uh, this uh, uh, that uh, Accenture. Accenture. Mm-hmm. Then uh, we have uh, Infosys. Infosys. And uh, we have uh, Cognizant, etc. And one more cap, Gemini or somebody. Okay. Mm-hmm. Of the 3.2 million employees in the top 10, 2.3 million are Indians. We dominate. Mm-hmm. Bangalore has 2.3 million people working in technology, more than Silicon Valley. I see. And by 2026, we'll have more people working in technology in India than in America. I see. America has 10 million people working in technology, 6 million in America, out of which 1 million are Indians. Mm-hmm. Out of 4.5 million Indians, 1 million reportedly work in that company, plus H&B and all that. Okay. And out of the uh, 4 million working for America globally, uh, 3, 3 million come from India out of the 5.5. Mm-hmm. So 4 million of the 10 million working for American companies, software Indians, mm-hmm. and we dominate. We are the country which has the largest pool of human talent in IT, in the world. Yes. And we are growing. Yes. China too has, they've got extra, but they're not export oriented, they're not overseas export. And now, if you look at a balance of payments, you get a very funny thing. 
we import about 200 220 billion dollars of oil uh -huh. about we export about 75 80 billion dollars we got 125 130 billion dollars of deficit uh -huh. we're exporting 135 billion dollars software so and this software is exported by one percent of our workforce workforce is 550 million five and a half million a year okay and we export more software than saudi arabia exports oil look at this great country and because of the, because of that the balance of payment is coming down hmm. the deficit is coming down we have a trade deficit about 200 210 billion dollars and we have a, uh, a surplus in uh, service of 145 150 160 billion dollars uh -huh. balance comes as fdi two percent fdi and uh, FPI is money coming in. So if the if the balance of payments increase improves and the service and the services are moving in double digits, mm -hmm. we will soon see a time when the currency depreciation will stop. Right. Mm -hmm. That will be the time when our true economic growth will be reflected in dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rupee went down from 75 to 82. People like Kaushik Basi were jumping up and down. Bangladesh has got more per capita income than India. Yeah, Bangladesh done very well, but the unsophisticated economy, it depends on remittances and, uh, 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 you know, garments and etc. Garments, yes. Underpaying the women, exploiting the labor there uh, for 55, 60 billion dollars. Mm. Yes, all the social industries are done well, it's a very special case. But, you know, to jump up and down, India has been overtaken by this, what has Modi done? That's the whole point. Right. Now, India has grown further, nobody talks about it. Mm. And Bangladesh currencies were uh, overvalued. They're, they're losing their uh, reserves and all that, whereas India's reserves are going up. Right. So, if we look at what happened in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, uh -huh. what happened in Pakistan, uh -huh. what a basket game, a terrible basket game. Yes. They're living in delusion. That right. country lives in delusion. And what is going to happen in Bangladesh, if uh, things don't work out, mm. it is scary. Right. India has done well and we don't get credit. Mm. So, that is, that will solve our big problem. In our economy, the biggest challenge is the fact that we need overseas uh, dollars and all to come in because we have a they have huge trade deficit. Now, the trade deficit can go up if we start manufacturing more and exporting. Hmm. And to manufacture more and exporting, we must uh, uh, build at lower costs, right. except lower profits. Right. And I'm sure the capital markets will understand that. Hmm. Let me give some data also, Abhijit. Okay. You know, hmm. last year, CBTD issued a circular to say that they collected 10 lakh 4,000 crores of corporate tax for the entire system. Okay. 10 lakh 4,000 crores at a tax rate of 25%. Because the corporate tax 25%, effective tax rate is what the actual rate is. Hmm. But take 25. Pre-tax income of 40 lakh crores. 40 lakh crores. 25, this 25% yes. into 4. Yes. GDP is 273 lakh crores. 15%. 15% of the GDP. 15% of GDP is corporate profits, man. Invest, grow and scale. Right. Now they're doing it. Right. So government must get out of the way and help them. Yes. Do that. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, one of these uh, princelings say, oh, Ambani is bad. And, and then, how can you abuse industries who done very well for this country and create jobs? They are the ones who created wealth, not you, man. You are living in luxury in Delhi because the wealth of the taxpayers. You are living in luxury. What is it that you are contributor, they come? Nothing. And you abuse the people who contributed. That attitude should go. Yes. The Gujaratis have got the right attitude. <laughs> right. Because so I think I think so India is very positive. You must carry this story to every young Indian. Jobs are being created. The problem with jobs is this: eighty percent jobs pay less than twenty-five thousand rupees a month. That's not enough. Yes. People want forty-five, fifty thousand rupees a month. Yes. So we are not producing the kind of jobs. Mm -hmm. And how do you produce more kind of jobs? You produce more kind of job by making them more productive, by expanding the economy. At which time it will come. Right. Just the other day. Somebody told me, that, I don't know, I must check up the data. They said, in neighboring Hosur, minimum wages in manufacturing is 12,000 rupees. Okay. In Bangalore, is 20,000 rupees. I see. So, no wonder that uh, Bangalore is losing out some business. People want cheaper labor. But why should they get only 12,000? Why can't they increase to 15,000? Mm. You're exploiting labor. Mm -hmm. For yes. what reason? People will still come. Yes. Because with automation, labor use is less. Mm. Automation is creating new jobs. So, we have to grow and for the growth, export is important and though they must make this commitment and work towards that. See, today, manufacturing is becoming robotic. Mm -hmm. Yes. The robots cost this almost the same all over the world. So, you set up a factory, land building, cost may be similar, robots are similar uh -huh. and then electricity tariff, labor cost has come down and the value of the labor was 40% now maybe come to 20-25%. Mm -hmm. So, productivity doesn't matter more and the robots will work 24 into 7.
Hmm. A friend of mine went to China, saw a factory one kilometer deep by half a kilometer. No lights. They said nobody working, they're all robots. Hmm. I see. And they're working. Hmm. Something goes wrong, red light come, we go to the PC and it's like check it up. Hmm. And then the goods are manufactured, put outside, the lorry takes it away, autonomous vehicles. I see. That's become like that. Mm -hmm. So, Indian industry is going into robotics in a heavy way, right. setting up new factories, cost will come down. Uh -huh. So, they must create scale and excess capacity and they must export. The thinking is now coming because now uh, investment says we'll go up to 250 billion tons of steel. Okay. So, you go to 300. Mm -hmm. The government has spoken. The mindset of industry should change. Government is doing all that it can. Uh -huh. Infrastructure, roads, railways and all that. Uh -huh. but, the, but now the problem is the state governments in many states have become very corrupt. To get a building approval in Bangalore, you have to pay bribes. To get an uh, occupant certificate, you could pay. It doesn't matter whether BJP or Congress, both are doing it. But what people say is, it has been there in Tamil Nadu for long, but once you take the bribe, they do the work. Here, yeah, they don't do the work. And I heard in Karnataka, I'm not blaming the Congress and BJP, both are the same. I heard in Karnataka that officials form a consortium, put in money, and pay a bribe to get one of them appointed in a place where you have to give approval. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they make money. For my building approval near the Manipal University, <coughs> they asked for a bribe of 10 lakhs. I said, I'm not going to give it. I went to the minister and spoke to everybody. That officer is saying, sir, what can I do, sir? I paid one crore for the seat, sir. I have to recover the money, sir. <laughs> How can I recover, not recover the money? What do I do? I see. That is a tragedy. Uh -huh. So they have to reduce that thing. Yes. Ola was here. They went to Hasur. Mm. And then you had Aether here, EV, EV vehicle man. They went to Hussur. Okay. Where this government did not give them land. They could have given them land in uh, Kolar Goldfields or somewhere. And that the minister uh, was a very corrupt fellow. So this should stop. The states are holding back India's growth. That's a problem. States. Hopefully, Yogi will demonstrate that and take it up. Maharashtra should now become more proactive. Gujarat is becoming good proactive. See, Gujarat has got a big problem which mm. they have to solve. If you look at the composition of the GDP, 45% uh -huh. of Gujarat GDP is manufacturing. Okay. 35% is services. Balance uh -huh. is agriculture. Uh -huh. In Karnataka, 66% is services. Okay. And then manufacturing is 20%. I see, I see. And, and agriculture, 20% uh, is 86, 14%. Hmm. And the income in services is five times the income that you get in agriculture and three and a half times what you get in industry. Okay. That means services are not developed there and you can't go on having manufacturing because when you have manufacturing, more and more sufficient, for example, Micron. When Micron comes, you may invest one, two, three, four billion dollars. It's not going to produce so many jobs because it's fully yes. automated. Yes. You're going to spend so much of money. And for the skill work, the Gujaratis, do you think they have the skills of the training? They don't. They'll get people from outside. Then the lower level for industry, bearing wage, you think the Gujaratis come there, they don't come. The Biharis come, everybody mm. comes. Okay. Like Modi said, Bihar ke log aate hai, kaam karte hai, jab wo jate hai, wapas Bihar ko sab se kete ki Gujarat ka kitna development hua hai. Okay. Hmm. You understood what it means? Yes. yes sir. So your people are not doing the who's, so where are the high quality jobs being created? Exactly, yes. I went to Ahmedabad uh -huh. and I walked around. You don't see so many people like in uh, Delhi or Bangalore or in, um, in the old Bombay, well dressed and well educated. You don't see them so much. Okay. The very thin layer. Uh -huh. So the middle class is lower. Of course, the richer class and trading class are getting richer. Middle class. You require a huge middle class. We do. Yes. The middle class with good paying jobs, highly educated, do this. So Gujarat has got a structural problem which mm. they have to solve. Okay. Interesting. Mm. Uh -huh. See, that's why you must analyze the GDP. I'll give you a report. Analyze. Okay. Analyze the GDP. Look at all the data. Understand the nuance and see uh -huh. what has to be done. Each state should have its own thinking how it can grow its economy. Government of India makes policy, but they must have their own policies, focus on those areas which give them the greatest return, education, skill development, etc. Mm -hmm. That's not happening because the thinking is very poor. Right. Very interesting. Something to ponder about. Yeah. Sir, you were uh, the CFO for Infosys and you were involved with the, with the company from the very beginning. Could you please tell the story? Of the no, no. I see Infosys was formed in 81 mm -hmm. in Pune by Narayan Murthy. Mm -hmm. He used to work in Patni Computers. Then he left because of certain things. So mm -hmm. Some event happened where he felt humiliated by Patni. I, I told him that, look, I decide that you don't decide because he's running the company. Uh -huh. So he gave up and said he will yeah, <coughs> start a company and he got his six colleagues. And um, he gave equity to all of them. He mm. didn't have to. He took a salary, which is only 20% of the salary he was getting earlier. And he showed leadership example and sacrifice. But it was controlled. Then they found Pune to be expensive. They came to Bangalore in 1982. Okay. From 82 to 1993, they only grew 
to maybe 3 million or something very low mm. in india the closed economy you know you couldn't export software software is exported by floppy disk okay and when you had a 64 kbs link the customer sitting there saying what are you do sending out i mean that's it right. you should not talk about this time till we got the stpi mm. so then i joined they made an ipo in 1993 july uh-huh. and i was running some other company called prakash leasing i bought some shares in ipo okay. i went to the ipo um, presentation questioned them and all that mm. then in october of 93 i went to an analyst meet they had in bombay first time mm-hmm. with vallabh bansali he was running inan he did it and i asked three questions vallabh told muthi don't answer these questions then after january of 94 nandan met me and said why don't you come and join uh-huh. so i joined by march or something i, I lost my father in april very traumatic period for me okay. but then i grew because i told muthi i don't want to work where i'm an employee okay. i want to be independent mm. see in my earlier company it was a punjabi family company they had a fight then one of them came said mohan tu kyu baat karta hai tu to naukar hai acha ha the family debuts you are tu to naukar hai they superior ya malik hai tu naukar hai i'm better 100% more educated than him that what hurt me so i mm. went there and said i don't want to be an employee anywhere i don't want to be treated but uh, in october then we did a private placement that time we produced an annual report which was sold in the black market in bombay because we set standards in disclosure financial reporting we got the gap of seven countries quarterly reporting all the practice you are corporate governance infosys did first before it was law i see so because murthy told us we may not be the biggest but you have to be the best and we want to be the best Then for Nasdaq listing, we said in '95 we'll do the Nasdaq listing by 2000. Started preparing in '97. We did all the U.S. gap ourselves, everything ourselves. Mm. We finally listed in '99. We were I think 80, 90 million dollars then. Okay. And we are raising 72 million. Mm-hmm. On the roadshow, I think valuation doubled, nearly doubled. And uh, you know, I still remember that uh, when we were on the road in the second week. There's no book, so Murthy told us to call it off. We got agitated, mm. so I had to speak to Vala Bansali and pacify him. And for seven two million, we got a book of three point six billion. And then we had to fight with the bankers for the pricing. They suggested thirty seven dollars. We said thirty four dollars. Okay. First time they said somebody has asked for lower price than what we suggest. There will be fights for a higher price. I see. Because Murthy said we are only issuing three percent of the stock, and we all said that. We also said. is not only murthy we are also responsible here we give credit for murthy but you know is a team effort and uh, uh, we want the 97% to do well not this 3% and all mm. see all price them 97% all the jokers who stock price is fallen up to listing the cream the market who got hurt the new entrants are 10 15% yes. 85% of old entrants uh-huh. their value has gone down yes yeah, sir they should have protected them at the, and not cream the 15% 15% mm. has lost 85% has lost they get black and they fail because they greedy they don't understand markets uh-huh. so we got listed when the murthy was sitting in the front and the cameras were like there the screen at the back and then the listing price came 53 dollars it was a tremendous thing and um, murthy said a, a, a giant step for infosys a small step for india <laughs> on a tv interview that time I see. and we all then we got our face on the nasdaq screen for the listing then we came back to india Uh, and uh, on the way back you know when landed here there were people waiting to receive me in the airport and when the listing happened nasdaq there were 5000 people in the campus are jumping up and down so build a great country mm. and murthy is an extraordinary leader abhi ji let me say on record on your podcast yes there are possibly five people from business who require who need to be given bharat ratna i hope modi is listening and gives them and he must take the stand one is jrd tata he's already got bharat ratna right yes gentil great uh, entrepreneur big professional nehru oppressed him suppressed him you know yes. his stories yes. never allowed him to expand but he was a good post independence the tallest leader then came dhirubhai ambani in the 70s dhirubhai ambani showed india how to build scale he burst all the rules hmm. nobody could stop him and he built scale he brought in the equity culture he brought in scale he did unbelievable thing he changed the face of india hmm. and reliance is a result of that yes next is narayan murthy the 90s he infosys came up set the standard for corporate governance for the first time the passport had great value oh you're a software engineer you're from bangalore the world look at in now i see 
and Infosys is the poster child, setting standards, going everywhere, mm. extraordinary leadership. We hired people, we gave stock options. 20,000 people out of 50, other 40,000 got stock option, became millionaires. I see. So the great things that uh, Murthy and everybody, all of us did. Mm. So I think that worked. And then in the last decade, two people, uh, Mukesh Ambani for getting Jio. Jio is Jio is transformed India. 50, 50, 50 billion dollars he spent and he transformed India at a time when he came out of the battle with his brother and he did it. Unbelievable man. Yes. Mukesh Ambani is an absolutely brilliant man. Mm. His understanding of business, his willingness to take risk, unbelievable what he has done for this country. Mm. Then Nandan Nilakani. Okay. Nandan Nilakani for the last 12 years has given us Aadhaar, has given us UPI, has given us the India stack, mm. has given us threats has given us this uh, new platform for mom and pop shops to come ONDC and others. It's unbelievable. He's transformed India. There's okay. nobody like him anywhere in the world who's transformed a country by having a series of digital initiatives, creating what you call digital public goods. Mm. So he is a Bharat Ratna. Because these five people have demonstrated how to change this country and become role models over the last 75 years. Right. So Infi was a great thing. And I'm very fortunate to be part of a great country which grew its economy from 275 billion to 3.34 trillion last year. Mm. I was very grateful to be part of a great industry which grew from 50 million exports to 200 billion dollars last year, IT services, and to part of a great company which set standards, Infosys, and did it so much for people right. in this country. Right. So, where do you see India in 2050? How optimistic are you? I'm very optimistic. India will be among the top three nations, that mm. is for sure. Mm. Whether it will vote the <coughs> United States to be more than China, I don't know. Okay. In total GDP, it might. Mm -hmm. In per capita, it will not. Okay. It will never be what the US is in per capita. Mm -hmm. It will not happen. Mm -hmm. Because we are undervalued. Today, if you take PPP, Abhijit, mm -hmm. our PPP is $12.2 trillion, as again nominal 3.4. Mm -hmm. China nominal is 20, PPP is about 32. Right. Higher than the US. Right. So China's PPP multiple is 0 0.6 times. India's PPP multiple is 3.5 times. Hmm. We're totally undervalued the economy. Okay. So it has to show up in the valuation someday. So I'm very positive. We'll have a we'll have an aging population, lesser number of young people. Hmm. The diversity between states may expand. That is the cause of danger. Hmm. So some of the states will be failed states like Bengal and uh, Bihar. And uh, same politics, I don't know whether any change in politics will come, same cacophonous politics. Hopefully, young people will enter politics and try to make this country better, mm. but India will go forward. There will be greater respect for Hinduism among the Hindu community mm. because once they stop being beggars, because they're poor, they get pride in what they are. Yes. And the world will respect India more for being an ideal democracy, extremely diverse, extremely inclusive, because once they understand what the culture is, what India is doing, because this is the biggest, greatest experiment in democracy in human history. Right. You can abuse it, you can piss on it, doesn't matter. We don't care a damn. We'll take it forward. Indeed. Yes. And you ask any young Indian of any substance, they say, I take India forward. Look at this. Didn't have it 20 years back. Didn't have it. Yes. Didn't have it when I came into the workforce. We are beaten. And for us to do something, we are rebels. So I'm very, very positive. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I'm going to end on that, on that very positive note. Thank you, sir. We have to be positive, Abhijit. Absolutely. Abhijit, I'm 65. Yes. I leave, I lead to the time when India is a close economy. Not that we felt it. Mm. We are happy. Mm. We didn't know what is better. Right. I leave to the time of emergency. Right, right. Where right. is to go out to the to a gate and wait for the newspaper to come, and the newspaper is to come with a blank front page. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because they didn't allow the editorial and all, they were bashed, they banned mm. them up. Then we are leaned through uh, the Janta Party experiment where mm. we all march on the street, we felt the thing, but it failed. Mm. We leave through um, the Indira Gandhi coming back, right? And we leave through liberalization. Yes. Where India opened up. Yes. And we are much better today than earlier. I think and it's are, going to get much better. Yes. We have more money to educate our children, mm. to live better. Yes, the, the mobility, there are pains in mobility challenges. There are uh, environment challenges which we should solve. Hopefully, they're solving. There are enough voices there. So, we have to be positive. Yes. And we have a great future. Agreed, sir. Because we're not aging like the West. Yes. So, we are growing. We have a consumption per capita is still low mm -hmm. and people income go up, they'll consume more. Yes. So they need more investment. And we are brilliant 
intellectual capacity. Yes. We have filed the third largest number of patents and papers in the world. Mm. So, US, China, India. Because okay. you can't compare us with a small country like UK, 65 million. You can't. People make that uh, challenge. We should compare with China. Yes. <laughs> and we're going up multiple engines of growth. And young people who are proud of the country. Yes. So, I think this is fantastic, man. The great time to be. It's a great time. I'm working to be. harder than ever. I see. I worked very hard in my life. Uh -huh. 12, 14 hours a day, 7 days a week. I see. Till I left Infosys in 2006. I see. Because I said I want my life back. Uh -huh. You know, it's very rigorous. We did so much. I mm. wanted my life back. I left. Now, I'm seeing growth. I'm seeing entrepreneurs. I'm seeing this excitement. Yes, there are failures. There are things happening. But the momentum is so good. And technology is empowering every Indian. You see, miracles happen in this country. So, if you're not optimistic and an Indian, go to the US. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, that was the conversation. Hope you liked it. If you enjoyed this, please share this on WhatsApp and other media. Thank you very much and I'll see you soon.